Да, сначала нас выступит Сергей Владимирович Звонарев. Уважаемые коллеги от лица Уральского гуманитарного института, разрешите вас поприветствовать на международной научной конференции, которая проводится на базе Уральского федерального университета. Сейчас, конечно, интересный формат, когда вроде как у нас аудитория, мы на базе УКИ находимся, но еще и параллельно в онлайне. В принципе, здесь есть свои плюсы, свои минусы, но тем не менее, я думаю, что это, наоборот, позволит ну, работу сделать более плодотворной, более интересной. А, успел прочитать программу научной конференции. Приятно, что такой, ну, даже не знаю, как сказать, интересный профессорский состав а, в программе заявлен из ведущих российских и зарубежных университетов. Но вот здесь в аудитории приятно видеть, что присутствует молодежь. То есть я а, почти... 8 лет был председателем различных советов молодых ученых, мы занимались вовлечением молодежи в науку. И вот научные конференции как раз одно из тех мероприятий, где можно а, посмотреть на всю широту научных исследований в рамках не своей какой-то узкой части, а большой, широкой части а, вот той научной тематики, в которой вы находитесь, посмотреть смежные области. Поэтому я хочу пожелать вам а, на конференции интересных докладов, плодотворной работы, общения, ну и, конечно, новых интересных проектов и их реализации. Поэтому отличной вам конференции. Спасибо. Спасибо. Здравствуйте, уважаемые коллеги. Очень рад всех видеть. Прекрасно, что мы с вами собрались. И я хотел бы подчеркнуть, что наша конференция проводится регулярно. Это уже десятая наша конференция в рамках... Девятая, извиняюсь, конференция в рамках нашего урал аналитикона И мне кажется... Философия – это именно такая область, где конференции имеют особенно большой вес. Философия не существует вне, вне диалога, вне реального диалога. Под реальным я имею в виду и офлайн, и онлайн. И виртуального диалога – это диалог ну, с умершими, допустим, классиками, спор с ними и так далее. Вот. Философия просто не существует из этих условий, она в изоляции ничего не значит и в принципе невозможно. В принципе, невозможно. Ну и вот в связи с этим я бы хотел обратиться к теме нашей конференции. Наша конференция посвящена абстрактным объектам. Ну, я надеюсь, что абстрактные объекты нуждаются в абстрактном мышлении абстрактные объекты в абстрактном мышлении. И я бы хотел подчеркнуть, что в процессе диалога, в процессе общения, обращаясь к древним, общения на горе, решающее слово как раз принадлежит именно тем, кто мыслит абстракт. Решающее слово принадлежит... Сократу, его оппонентам, а вовсе не тем, кто мыслит конкретно. Те, кто мыслит конкретно, они не могут размышлять об абстрактных объектах, в принципе. И мне бы хотелось вот немножечко поправить Георга Фергельна Фридриха Гегеля, который говорил, что... Лучше всего абстрактно мыслят торговки на, на рынках. Ну, на горе, значит, э, э, вовсе не торговки. Сократ и его оппоненты, именно они лучше всего мыслят. А торговки, которых так любил Георг Фергер, находятся э, в сторонке. И вопросы экономические, политические и прочие э, э, на горе не могут иметь решающего веса. 
именно представители абстрактного мышления, мыслящие об абстрактных объектах, это то, что нам нужно. И я, я уверен, все продемонстрируют высоту абстрактного мышления. И мы насладимся вопреки Георгу Вергельму Фридриху Гекли. Спасибо за внимание. Нихао, нихао, цин, тодуа ганжао. I'm just kidding. So from now on we stop talking Russian, we speak English instead. Uh, I'm really pleased to see you again at our annual conference, Analyticon. The topic of uh, this year's conference is abstract object, as already was said. And let me introduce our first key speaker, Evgeny Borisov, please. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say many thanks to the organizers of this conference. Uh, conferences of this series have, also, uh, have always been uh, highly interesting and highly helpful. Uh, for me personally, I think not just for me, and um, I'm happy to take part in this conference and yeah, uh, let me start. Uh, my presentation is related to the problem of cross-rail communication uh, and uh, after I expose the topic in more detail, uh, let me tell uh, uh, let, let me say a couple of words about the phenomenon of cross-world predication. Uh, what does it mean? Mm. <clears throat> Compare these three sentences. John is taller than Paul, John might be taller than Paul, and John might be taller than Paul actually is. Uh, if we uh, analyze these sentences, the meaning in terms of uh, possible semantics, then uh, we can see that uh, the first sentence compares John and Paul in, within the, the actual world. Uh, the actual world is the world of evaluation of our sentence. Uh, uh, the second sentence compares the same persons, uh, John and Paul, in a possible world accessible uh, from the actual one. Uh, and uh, the first and the second sentences look very ordinary, standard. Uh, the third sentence uh, looks, uh, looks unusual. It compares them across past two worlds. Uh, the third sentence, John might be told and Paul actually is, compares John as he is in a possible world and Paul as he is in the actual world. So uh, we take one person from one world, the other person from another possible world, and then we compare uh, them. Uh, that's, uh, th uh, the third sentence is an example of classical communication. Okay. Uh, now the phenomenon of cross-field predication in a more formal, uh, more detailed definition. Uh, let's take uh, let's take n objects, object O one, O two, uh, up to O n. Uh, let's take n possible worlds. W1 uh, up to Wn, and uh, then uh, 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 we associate each object with a possible world. Um, I express this association uh, by saying that an object is taken from a possible world. We might also say an object as it is 
in a possible world and so on. So uh, we associate uh, objects with possible worlds and then, um, uh, uh, then we can define the cross world predication as ascribing to objects associated, uh, ascribing a relation to objects associated, uh, associated with possible worlds. Um, uh, <coughs> O1 is it is in W1 up to ON as it is in WN, where the n place relation are to each other. Uh, this is uh, if, if we ascribe to objects associated with possible well such, such relations, uh, we uh, have the phenomenon of cross field predication. Um, more examples might be used, for instance, John should be more polite. Uh, if we analyze this uh, in terms of uh, deontic logic, uh, deontic possible, deontic version of possible world semantics, then this sentence says that uh, in each normatively ideal possible world, John is more polite than he is in the actual world. John as he is in normatively ideal worlds is more polite than John as he is in the actual world. This is an example of cross field predication, and uh, there are lots of other examples. Okay, uh, now the problem. Uh, the problem raised by this phenomenon, the phenomenon of cross world predication, is very simple. The standard uh, model logic, I mean, the standard, uh, the ordinary um, first order model logic doesn't see cross field predication. Uh, in ordinary speech, we uh, can say things like, John might be more polite. Uh, so uh, we use cross field predication in, for instance, in ordinary speech, in, in our ordinary language. Uh, of course, uh, we might, uh, encounter this phenomenon cross field predication uh, in other discourses as well. Uh, and if we try to, to formalize uh, reasonings uh, in these languages uh, using uh, first order model logic, using the standard first order model logic, then, uh, the, the, then we discover that this is in, impossible uh, simply because the standard model logic doesn't see cross field predication. Uh, the standard model logic uh, sees only, uh, only interval predication, like John might be taller than John might be taller than Paul. Uh, it, is, uh, it says that uh, John is taller than Paul within a possible world, maybe uh, not actual. But uh, any, anyway, um, um, <coughs> in terms of the standard post, uh, model logic, we can compare or uh, uh, consider uh, only objects within one and the same possible world. We cannot compare objects associated with different possible worlds within one and the same atomic sentence in describing the relation. Okay, uh, this is a problem, and uh, so if we want to uh, to logically analyze reasonings involving cross world predication, we need uh, a, a non-standard uh, first order model logic uh, capable of, of reflecting this phenomenon. And uh, there are uh, a number of attempts to elaborate uh, such a logic. Uh, we, uh, listed some of them, and uh, now the topic of my presentation. Uh, <clears throat> my presentation is devoted to, to the last two, uh, two projects in this list. Uh, <clears throat> Alexander Kopirak in 2016 uh, proposed uh, a logic for uh, a, a first order model logic uh, capable of reflecting this phenomenon and uh, I, uh, a, a little bit later uh, I proposed my own uh, project and uh, 
I would like today to to present and to uh, to compare shortly these two uh, versions of cross uh, of, of uh, uh, these two logics for cross field predication. Okay. <clears throat> now the introduction uh, uh, has just finished. And now the, uh, the next section, syntax and the semantics of CP8. CP8 uh, from uh, cross-world predication logic. Uh, this is my project. This is what I am suggesting. But the uh, logic I have Now, CP8 is based on, on the language that contains, as usual, uh, as, as in all standard uh, model logics, uh, a, a set of individual variables, uh, individual constants, uh, predicted symbols of uh, different aritim, uh, logical uh, operators uh, are all usual, including lambda operator. And of course, <clears throat> for my limits. So uh, the vocabulary of uh, this logic is uh, totally standard. Uh, I mean, uh, standard for the first order model logic. Now, uh, this is the definition of formula. It is recursive, atomic formula, and, uh, and so on. Uh, including formulae containing the interoperator. And uh, an important thing uh, about uh, the syntax uh, of this logic is that uh, we cannot immediately combine predicate symbols and individual constants. We cannot uh, write P of A if P is a one place predicate and A is an individual constant. Uh, this is not a formula. Uh, in order to combine, <coughs> we can combine uh, a predicate and an individual constant only via uh, a lambda operator. Or we can write uh, 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 this expression is a formula, this expression isn't a formula. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, this means that in atomic formula, we can have only individual variables. Uh, we cannot have uh, individual constants in atomic formula. Okay, uh, and a notational convention. I will write a formula with lambda operator in this shortened notation. Uh, so in this notation, we don't see the letter lambda. And nevertheless, uh, this is the lambda operator uh, using uh, the term T and binding the variable X. Uh, in my view, uh, this notation makes the formula more readable. Uh, this formula and this one, uh, say, uh, uh, they are notational variants of each other, uh, but uh, the formula above seem to be more readable, more clear than uh, the formula below. Okay, and uh, so main semantic novelties uh, of this logic first. Uh, it is based on cross-world interpretation of predicates. And second, second uh, in this logic, uh, I will say what, what, what it means uh, in a minute. And uh, second, uh, in this logic, uh, in its semantics, we relativize those values not just to matters possible worlds and variable operations, but also to, uh, uh, to, to functions of special type. I call them VP functions, V from variable, P from possibility or possible world. Uh, uh, they are functions from variables to possible worlds. Okay. <clears throat> um, what is the cross field interpretation of predicates? Uh, the uh, main idea is it's not my idea. <coughs> it's not my idea. I borrow it from, from Butterfield and Sterling. Uh, <coughs> uh, 
basically, this idea is very simple. Uh, in the standard model logic, uh, in a model, we have different possible worlds. And uh, let's consider a end uh, place predicate. Uh, in the standard model semantics, uh, uh, the predicate has an extension for each possible world. One possible world, one extension, the other possible world, the other extension, so <coughs> How many possible worlds? So many extensions. Uh, if we, uh, and uh, this is uh, the intra world interpretation of predicates. Uh, cross world interpretation of predicates. Uh, we have cross world interpretation of predicates. If we, if a predicate, if a n place predicate has an extension for each n tuple of possible worlds, for instance, a binary predicate dollar uh, has an extension for, for the pair of possible worlds w1, w2, sorry, w1, w2. Uh, it has another extension for, uh, for, for the other pair w2, w1, uh, yet another extension for w1, w1, yet another for w2, w2. Uh, how many pairs of possible worlds? So many extensions. Uh, the extension of an n, n place predicate is relativized not to, uh, not to possible worlds, but to n locals of possible worlds. Um, so, uh, we may have uh, the following situation. The n tuple of objects is in the extension of an enary predicate uh, R for this n tuple of possible worlds. Uh, the intuitive meaning of this situation is as follows the object O1 associated with W1. The object O1 taken from W1, the object O2 taken from W2, and so on. Uh, all these n objects, each associated with a possible world, are in the relation denoted, denoted by this uh, n repetitive uh, uh, This is the cross field indication. Uh, for instance, for instance uh, this pair, John and Paul, uh, may happen to be in the extension of dollar for these two possible worlds. This says that John, as he is in W1, is taller than Paul, as he is in W2. Uh, this is the intuitive meaning of uh, cross-field dedication. Um, by the way, we don't lose the Interworld predication in this semantics because the interworld predication is uh, a, a special case of cross world predication. Uh, <coughs> if the, uh, um, we, we may think that uh, these objects, O1 up to OM, bear the relation R in W, and we can express this in, uh, in cross world semantics in the following way. Uh, this uh, n tuple of objects is in R's extension for this n tuple of possible worlds, uh, pairwise identical uh, possible worlds. Okay, now uh, the second semantic novelty. It, it, is, uh, it, uh, it, it is my in invention, uh, unlike uh, the cross-field interpretation of predicates, uh, this is what I am suggesting. Um, again, uh, in the standard uh, uh, first order model logic, we relativize truth values to three things: models, possible worlds, uh, and uh, variable variations. Uh, <clears throat> In CPL, uh, in the logic uh, I am presenting, uh, <coughs> truth values are relativized to four things. What 
examples possible those variable valuations and the pp functions uh, pp function is a partial function from variables individual variables to possible worlds of the model mm. this is a notational convention a formula phi is true in the model m with respect to the possible world w uh, the variable valuation v and vp function f okay uh, what good are vp functions uh, uh, imagine we evaluate uh, this atomic formula with respect to m, w, and, and so on. And uh, <clears throat> since uh, we have to do this cross world interpretation of predicates, uh, mm, uh, first, uh, this, uh, this n triple of variables together with the variable variation v generates an n triple of objects v of x1 up to v of xn. This is a n tuple of objects. And now uh, we have to check whether this n tuple of objects is in the extension of R, in the extension of R for, for which n tuple of possible worlds. This is the question we have to uh, uh, answer. And, uh, and uh, VP function provides the answer to this question. Uh, we have, uh, we use the same n tuple of variables and we use the uh, function f, uh, the function from variables to possible worlds. So uh, we get the n tuple of possible worlds, f of x1 up to f of xn. Uh, so uh, VP functions generates n tuple of possible worlds we need in order to, to evaluate atomic formula containing energy predicates. Okay, uh, um, so uh, variables uh, perform a double job. Just uh, together with variable valuation, they uh, generate and tuples of uh, uh, tuples of objects, and together with VP functions, they, they generate tuples of possible worlds. Um, now, uh, models for this language. Uh, uh, model for this language is a quadruple containing a set of possible worlds, a accessibility relation, the domain. Um, uh, I am assuming. Uh, now, for simplicity, I am assuming uh, constant domain semantics. Uh, we might consider varying domain semantics as well, but uh, this would be uh, uh, this would involve more technicalities, more technical details. So, uh, let's confine ourselves to uh, uh, constant domain semantics. Now, D is the domain of the model. It is also the domain of each possible model, and the interpretation uh, of predicates and constants. The interpretation of individual constants. The interpretation of a constant is uh, it, 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 we have a misprint here. Ah, no, no sorry. <coughs> the interpretation of a constant uh, is a function from uh, possible wells to uh, objects uh, in the domain. So, uh, it takes a possible well. And, uh, uh, sense of the, the uh, the interpretation of uh, predicates is the cross world interpretation as I characterized it already. And uh, finally, the interpretation of uh, the misprint. Uh, here I mean the interpretation of equality sign. <laughs> the interpretation of equality sign is a diagonal uh, uh, of the domain, of course, uh, as usual. <clears throat> okay. Uh, variable valuations are defined as usual. PP functions uh, I have already defined. Uh, functions from uh, variables to possible wills. Uh, but uh, 
here I'd like to stress that they are partial functions, not partial functions. Okay, uh, we are going to use the radians of the configurations defined as usual. Uh, uh, this uh, x gradient of phi uh, uh, sends x to e and other variables sends to to, to e of, of them. Okay. And uh, x variant of a dp function is defined analogously. Uh, and uh, finally, the denotation. If we have a term here, the, uh, double uh, and uh, a possible well, then uh, this uh, denotation function uh, generated by V and I, uh, uh, if, if T is a variable, then PI of T and W is uh, simply V of T. And if T is a constant, then uh, E of T and W uh, is the, the, the value of uh, this function. Okay, uh, it, it is also a standard uh, standard definition. And now uh, the rules for, <coughs> for this logic. Uh, here here I, uh, I have to say that uh, I'm presenting now a simplified version of CPA semantics. Uh, here I ignore uh, some. <coughs> uh, uh, the semantics I'm going to present uh, encounters some problems that can be easily solved, uh, but, uh, uh, but uh, uh, I, I will not uh, present uh, these solutions um, uh, in order to save time. And, uh, for the sake of simplicity. So uh, this is a simplified uh, definition of truth. Uh, if we have, uh, if we uh, uh, evaluate this atomic formula, of course, uh, we uh, have to check whether this n-tuple of objects is in the extension of P for this n-tuple of possible goals. Again, uh, the same n-tuple of variables generates an n-tuple of objects and an n-tuple of possible goals. Uh, these two uh, items are totally standard, as well as this one, and as well as... Uh, uh, here we have an interesting uh, detail. <coughs> um, um, when we evaluate formula containing uh, uh, quantifiers, we associate, <coughs> we take an entity E in the domain, uh, in, in the domain of this model, and uh, we associate this variable X with E. Uh, so uh, we move from the variable relation V to and to, to, to this x variant of okay. and uh, also we um, associate uh, this uh, variable x with the current possible well double. So we move from uh, the VP function f to its x to, to this x variant thereof. And finally. Uh, when we evaluate a uh, formula containing the operator, uh, we have the three standard things and a, 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 a novelty. Uh, namely, a uh, land operator in this example uh, binds the variable x. Because of this, we uh, move uh, from the key function f to its x variant. Um, when, uh, when, when we process an operator binding a variable, uh, we associate this variable with the current possible world. And uh, uh, this is reflected uh, in, by, by this x variant of f and by this x variant of f. <coughs> okay. uh, the variable x is bound here. And uh, we, evaluate, uh, we process this operator with respect to the possible world double sum. We 
associate with this variable x with this possible goal double goal here and here in the last two lines. Okay, and uh, the last point. At the start of evaluation, we take the empty set as our VP function. Recall, VP functions are partial functions, so uh, the, the empty set is a partial function. We can use it. Um, <coughs> Now, uh, finally, here is an example. Consider the sentence drawn by Pierre Intuitively, uh, this sentence, uh, th this sentence, uh, this sentence says that John might be richer than he actually is. So, intuitively, uh, <coughs> uh, John in a possible world accessible from the actual world is richer than John as he is in the actual world. And I formalize uh, this sentence in uh, this way. Uh, we use a uh, lambda, lambda operator, then diamond, then again uh, a lambda operator, and then the atomic formula R, R is richer. Okay, and uh, let's evaluate uh, this formula with respect uh, uh, in a model L with respect to uh, to, to the possible world double. Uh, here we have uh, our starting point, uh, the, the starting VP function and the empty set. Uh, now, uh, this is true if and only if uh, we modify uh, in the second line, uh, 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 we process the first lambda operator and we modify our, uh, modify our variable variation and our VP function. Uh, John is uh, J uh, uh, is, is John taken in the actual world. Uh, then diamond takes us to another possible world W prime accessible from W. Then we process the second lambda operator and uh, we get uh, to new modifications of P and F. Uh, the evaluation in VP function, and finally we uh, evaluate this atomic formula, and we get the desired terms conditions. Uh, John associated with W prime is rich is in the extension of rich uh, <coughs> to, together with John associated with W. So we have the same object of the same person John here in this. Uh, ordered pair of objects, and we have different possible words here. So uh, we have uh, 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 we, we have described the cross world relation uh, in, in this uh, sentence, uh, and uh, it, this fact is reflected semantically in CP. Okay. Now, uh, the next part, uh, OCUREX uh, project uh, called QHL uh, for quantified hybrid project. So, um, this is a kind of hybrid project. And uh, the vocabulary of uh, this language, uh, LH uh, stands for language this hybrid logic. Uh, this is the language coherent uh, uh, The specificity, specific features of uh, vocabulary uh, of this language are as follows. Uh, first, uh, this language contains possible world variables, uh, not just individual variables, not just variables for objects, but also variables for possible worlds. S and so on. Uh, <clears throat> then uh, it has this hybrid term operator, triangle S, uh, triangle associated with a variable for possible world. And uh, uh, it contains also two sentential operators, this one and this one. Uh, again, S is a possible world. Uh, this is uh, 
uh, now let's characterize the syntax uh, of this language. Uh, this is the recursive definition of uh, terms in this language. Uh, an, an individual variable is a term, an individual constant is a term, and uh, finally, if you have a term, we can combine it with this triangle and get a, a, another term. And uh, this is the definition of formula. Uh, again, recursive. Tau 1 up to tau n are terms, of course. Here, uh, everything is standard. And uh, we can use this hybrid sentential operators in order to generate new, uh, new formula. Uh, OK. Now, <clears throat> I'd like to, 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 to draw your attention to uh, some, uh, some distinctions between this language and the language of CPA. Uh, first, uh, here in atomic formula, we can have not just individual variables, but terms of any type, including uh, individual constants. Then, uh, copyright doesn't use lambda operator, and uh, and, and finally, uh, uh, formula of uh, well, formula in this uh, language contain uh, expressions of totally new type, uh, namely variables, possible words. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, the, uh, the uh, definition of the model. Uh, again, we can uh, I, I simplify a couple of things uh, again in uh, presenting uh, copyright logic. Again, we can uh, consider models as, as uh, quadruples containing the set of possible world, the accessibility relation, the domain, and the interpretation. And uh, <clears throat> um, the the uh, uh, suggests uh, a new new vision of cross world interpretation. Um, the point is, what I write in this way, uh, Kolkera writes in, in this way. So uh, uh, in CPA, in, in my logic, uh, we have n tuples of objects in the extensions of predicates for n tuples of possible worlds. Uh, intuitively, this means that each object is associated with the corresponding possible world. And uh, Kolkerak uh, reflects this, uh, uh, this intuitive idea, uh, writes it in another way. Namely, uh, in his logic, uh, the extensions of possible worlds are sets of n tuples whose elements are pairs object world. Object world. Okay, but uh, intuitively, intuitively, these two uh, lines express the same. Uh, they have the same intuitive meaning. In, in both cases, uh, we have objects associated with possible worlds. Now, um, variable evaluations in uh, in QHL models uh, differ from variable evaluations in CP uh, because uh, they have to take care uh, not just of individual variables but also of uh, variables of a new type, possible world variables, and so on. In this print, uh, V of X is in D, P of S is in G, G is the set of possible world. Uh, it is a misprint here, sorry. And uh, denotation. Uh, 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 VI is the denotation function. Uh, it takes a term and the possible world and sends us to, to, to what? To a pair object world. Not, not just to an object, but to, the, to, an, to, to a pair object world. Uh, object associated with a world. And uh, 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 intuitively, 
the main things, uh, the main thing is here is the intuitive meaning of uh, this term operator. Triangle. Uh, this operator takes us. Uh, th this operator uh, again. <laughs> uh, uh, we apply this function to a term and the possible will, and what we get, we get an ordered pair object possible world. Uh, the possible world uh, to which we uh, apply the function w is also in this order. In the first line, in the second line, the same. Uh, we apply this function to c and w, and here we have an object. And here again, the same possible world w. The meaning of this operator is that we get here in the second place, we get another possible world, namely p of s. S is a variable to us. So uh, this is the notation in, uh, in his logic. And finally, truth. Uh, here, uh, this is an ordered pair object row. This is an ordered pair object row. So we apply the, the denotation function to these terms and W, and we get n ordered pairs of the world, and then we check whether they are in the extension of uh, If we, uh, this operator isn't very important for, for us. <laughs> this operator is important. Uh, uh, th this operator uh, uh, associates the variable variation S with the current possible world W. So uh, this operator transforms P into this uh, S variant of P. S associated with W. This variable, this possible world. Uh, this operator arrow associates this variable with this possible world. Now, an example. John might be rich. Let's. Uh, Let's evaluate this formula with respect to, 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 to these things. Uh, first, uh, first, we process this operator and it associates S with W. So we get this uh, S variant of P. Uh, then we process time and it sends us to a possible world W prime. For some W prime accessible. Uh, from that we have this. Now we have to evaluate uh, this atomic formula and we get the following. Uh, the denotation of this term with respect to W prime and denotation of this term with respect to W prime. These two order is possible uh, logic field. Uh, we check whether they are in the extension of R. And and finally, uh, we get this John associated with W prime and John associated with W. Mm -hmm. uh, they are, uh, uh, these two other pairs are in the extension of the predicate R. Uh, again, we have the same object here, John, John, but different possible worlds. John is associated with one possible world here, and uh, the same John associated with another possible world. Uh, this says that we have the phenomenon of cross-world predication here. So uh, uh, intuitively, uh, this sentence, John might be rich, uh, expresses a cross-world relation. And as we see, uh, Hockerick's logic is able to to semantically represent uh, relations of its type. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> very shortly, I'd like to compare uh, these two projects very shortly. <clears throat> uh, just uh, we have uh, different means, but same result in these two projects. Uh, in the CPA, we have a non-standard semantics, I mean, uh, a non-standard truth definition, because uh, we relativize uh, uh, truth values to, to an 
unusual thing, thing namely VP functions. But in CPL, we have uh, the standard formal language. Uh, uh, sorry, the, the language, the formal language is totally standard. Uh, in QHK, we have a more or less standard semantics without VP functions. Uh, but we have a non-standard formal language, uh, namely a hybrid long, uh, um, formal language, including these expressions. These are different means uh, that, uh, that allow us to get the same result, namely the ability of uh, reflecting uh, cross-world relations semantically. Uh, and uh, these logics, uh, both logics have comparative merits, uh, comparative advantages. Pure uh, HA, coherent logic, uh, has huge expressive power uh, because, uh, simply because uh, it uses uh, some, some, some expre uh, expressions of new types, uh, I mean hybrid expressions. Uh, possible world variables and uh, new term uh, operators and new sentential operators. And uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, increases the expressive power of uh, the logic uh, very essentially. And because of this, uh, his logic is able to, to solve some other problems, not just uh, the problem of um, cross field predication, but also some other problems, for instance, the problem of cross-world quantification. <clears throat> I, I am not going to, uh, to, 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 to say anything about this problem, uh, just, <clears throat> uh, uh, just uh, this observation. New expressions, uh, larger expressive power, the ability of uh, solving a uh, uh, larger list of problems. On the other hand, uh, CPL, in my view, has also an advantage, namely uh, that uh, its language, its formal language, is purely, purely modeled. It, it is not hybrid. Uh, hybrid language is um, uh, a kind of mix of object of, of the standard uh, model object language and meta language, semantic language, because, uh, for instance, uh, because possible worlds are, uh, are a meta linguistic semantic tools. It, it is a, a tool of meta linguistic analysis of language itself. Uh, in many cases, uh, variables for possible worlds, for constants for possible worlds, uh, they are not part of, of the model discourse. They are a meta linguistic semantic tool. And uh, if we include, for instance, variables for possible worlds into uh, the model language, uh, we get a mix of uh, object language and meta language. And um, in many cases, this is not desired. And uh, 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 the advantage of my project, of CPA, uh, is in my view, uh, lies in, in my view in the fact that um, I have shown that um, the problem of cross-world predication, not other problems, not the problem of cross-world quantification, for instance, but the problem of cross-world predication can be used without, uh, without using hybrid expressions. Uh, this problem can be used uh, using purely model language. This is my uh, main result that I wanted to uh, to, to present to you, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. So, any questions, please? I do prefer. Um, since I forgot this word in English, uh, so this symbol for this symbol, yes, this symbol. I do look at this symbol for your authority. Uh, <coughs> this symbol, it? Yes. 
it is a part of Polkurex uh, formal language. Uh, and uh, moreover, I, I, I said that Polkurex uh, logic is a, a cross world version of uh, hybrid model logic. Uh, there are different versions of hybrid model logic, and um, uh, in, in many of them, uh, this symbol is used. Uh, this is a standard, a standard part of uh, the vocabulary of hybrid uh, model logic. So it's, it's not my invention. Okay, any more questions? No? And thank you, Evgeny, so much. Th thank you very much for your kind attention again. So let me introduce our next key speaker, Ilyana Kagalina Chorna. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, nice city, my native city. Uh, nice company, nice talk. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, the, ah, the title of my uh, paper is Logics as Formal Ontologies, Abstract Logics, Abstract Systems, and Levels of Abstraction. Uh, uh, in my paper, I'd like to address an old but still puzzling question. Um, if logic uh, has no ontology, in what sense, if any, it is an ontology? To be more precise, I'm going to speak not about logic and ontology in general, but about abstract logic and formal ontologies. Okay, so my plan is a goal. I start with the interpretation of uh, abstract logics as formal systems. Second, I'll focus on the phenomenological idea of formal ontology. I suggest uh, considering abstract logic as formal ontology. In this historical part of my paper, I, I try to specify some problems with the centuries old idea that form corresponds to abstraction from matter in logic. Finally, my key concern will be uh, uh, the placing of the interpretation of abstract logics as formal ontologies in a framework of the levels. That is the method of levels of abstraction. What is gained then is inter in interpretation of abstract logic as classifications. So let me start with abstract logic. Abstract logic is the most fundamental notion of the abstract or generalized model theory. Uh, its definition is a generalization of the concept of truth as a relation between structures and sentences. As uh, John Barweis and uh, and jo John Barweis writes in his classical in a, cl a classical book, uh, Model Theoretic Logics. Uh, for a person in, in the street, logic is the study of valid forms of reasoning. However, the basic idea of model theory is that one can profit by paying attention to the relationship between some mathematical structures and some collections of expressions of a language used to describe properties of such, such structures. So with reference to Chen and Kessler, uh, I rise gives the following definition of a logic, the first definition. A logic consists of a collection of mathematical structures, a collection of formal expressions, and a relation of satisfaction between the two. Uh, we are interested in logic with uh, some important mathematical properties, uh, especially, especially those uh, where the classes of structures are closed under isomorphs. So we may define abstract logic in the following way. Uh, way. Um, definition two, an abstract logic consists of a collection of structure closed under isomorphism. Second, a collection of formal uh, expression and third, a, a relation of satisfaction between the two. Uh, you see that this definition doesn't include any condition concerning uh, rules of inference. If we accept the principle no logic without inference, 
It seems more appropriate to use here the term modopolitical language instead of the term abstract logic. Uh, even though uh, logicians uh, use term abstract logic, they do it frequently only by pragmatic uh, reasons of simplicity. However, my aim is to interpret abstract logics as formal ontologies, that is, as genuine logic, at least in this sense. To be more precise, I suggest considering types of isomorphism as model creative of analogs of categorical objects of Edmund Husserl's formal ontology. <laughs> the isomorphism of models is a relation of equivalence. The classes of equivalents of a set of models are called types of isomorphs. Isomorphic models can be regarded as indistinguishable uh, in any sense, unless they, we want to consider the inner structure of elements of their domains. Thus, any two isomorphic structures, models, excuse me, represent the same abstract system. So let's move to abstract systems. According to Stephen uh, Clini, a system that is non-empty set of objects with relation of, on it is called abstract if we know nothing about the objects of the system except the relations between them within the system. In this case, only the structure of the system is established while the nature of its objects remain uncertain in every respect except, except one, they correspond to this structure. Here, here is the, uh, the definition of uh, abstract system from clinic, from the introduction to that. Thus, abstract logic are theories of abstract systems on the one hand. On the, on the other hand, classes of isomorphism can be seen as formal object, as Gil share. Uh, pointed out, uh, speaking in terms of object, we can uh, say that formal objects are not just elements of formal structures, they are themselves formal structures. So abstract logics are theories of abstract system and theories of formal abstract uh, object at the same time, that is of classes of isomorphic structures or types of isomorphic structures. My proposal is to consider these abstract objects as categorical objects of Husserl uh, formal ontology. So let's move to Husserl. Husserl has pointed, uh, has planned uh, the project of formal ontology already in logical investigations, but uh, this project has been completely developed only in his later works, especially in ideas and formal and transcendental logic. His project of formal ontology was the realization of the great Descartes dream on Matthesis Universe Science. Husserl considered formal ontology as an a priori science of object in general. He believed that the transcendental justification of logic is possible only if we postulate a special region of abstract categorical objects. This region has to save logic from the specific relativism of Kant, who gave an interpretation of logical structures in terms of universal human abilities. Husserl considered logical structures as, structure, as structures of some objective domain of abstract higher level objects. So logic as formal ontology doesn't distinguish between specific individuals in the domain, but it is not empty in Kant's sense because it deals with individuals of higher order. So, uh, is the historical part uh, of my paper. The idea is that uh, logic is characterized by an invariance condition, that is by the things it doesn't distinguish between, has a long history. <coughs> Logical holomorphism, Consider, considers logic as a theory of formal relations, which takes their general properties and turns them into general law, laws of reason. Uh, its slogan is this, formal corresponds to abstraction from matter. However, form and matter can be characterized in a variety of ways. 
So the slogan may give different notions of the formal depending on what is to be considered as matter. As the abstraction from matter may concern terms and models. Thus, there are two main versions of the formality as invariability. The formal is schematic and the formal as is model theoretical invariance. Schematically, the uh, form is an argument uh, of an argument represents a scheme, a result of substitution of all the non-logical terms with, uh, with variables of the corresponding type. types. Uh, model theoretically, the formality of logic is specified in terms of being invariant under different non-structural variations of models, uh, under permutation of objects in the domain, for example, or under isomorph isomorphism, homomorphism, partial isomorphism of structure. Uh, so, several remarks uh, on this dichotomy can be made from, from a historical perspective. Uh, it is generally accepted that the logical phylomorphism goes back to the Aristotelian form versus matter dichotomy. According to Husserl, for example, I quote um, uh, Aristotle substituted algebraic letters uh, to the words um, indicated the material. Now, furthermore, according to Timothy Smiley, for example, Aristotle created mathematical logic by, by inventing its distinctive, distinctive object of study, the formalized language. However, the role of Aristotle as a founder of logical hylomorphism may be challenged. Surprisingly, surprisingly uh, Aristotle didn't apply formality as a crit criterion for logicality. Moreover, Aristotelian form versus meta distinction is absent from the organon. Aristotle applies this distinction uh, to logic only twice, in physics and in metaphysics. The two, uh, uh, the two passages are almost identical. Aristotle observes that the premises of an inference hypothesis are a matter for the conclusion. These passages do not imply the, the logical hylomorphism because they say nothing about the formal structure of the premises and the conclusion. As John McFarlane uh, pointed out, the father of both uh, formal logic and hylomorphism wasn't the father of logical hylomorphism. I tried to clarify this puzzle. So here, uh, first, Aristotle was clear about the dichotomy be between the matter and form of pri primary substances, but not of language entities. Second, he wasn't a merological hylomorphist. That is, he didn't take matter and form to be themselves parts of the whole they compose. For Aristotle, the form is not a part of the whole, but the essence of a being, the dynamic principle of its organization. Uh, as it is was shown by uh, Miles Bernard in, met in metaphysics, Aristotle distinguishes between logical and physical analysis. While logical analysis is uh, abstract, the physical studies address to the concept of matter and form as principle of appropriate to the subject. So one obvious challenge we meet now is that it is not easy to explain why Aristotle used letters of the alphabet like A, B, C uh, instead of concrete terms if he didn't distinguish uh, between logical form and logical matter. Uh, here is an example of uh, Barbara from the prior analytic. If A belongs to every B and B belongs to every C, it is necessary for A to belong to every C. Mm -hmm. Uh, according to uh, Lukas Lukashevich, Aristotelian syllogism is not inference schemata, but conditional propositions, as we know. Uh, he understands Aristotelian schematic letters as object letters, uh, language variables. Lukashevich writes the introduction of, I call the introduction of you know, variables into logic is one of the Aristotle's greatest inventions. Uh, the, editors of um, 
the prior analytics developed the striker notes that the I quote, the crucial innovation that make, makes the logistic a formal system is the introduction of letters as placeholders for the terms. In contrast, Artur Pryor was the first who claimed that Aristotelian logistics are metaphorical states in our terms. According to uh, Corcoran, for example, there is no need to postulate object language variables for Aristotle's system. Uh, for, for Corcoran, Aristotle's syllogistic is a theory concerned with the structure of inference. That is, his syllogistic proofs. He writes, Aristotle, no, no, uh, uh, no here, uh, refers to argument from form of propositional functions. All apparent ex exceptions are best understood as metalinguistic reference. The concrete syllogisms. Aristotelian grammar, as Corcoran tells us, is too trivial. By his semantics, however, is complex enough to admit to, uh, of analogs to modern syntactic or semantics results. As he put it, I quote, most of Aristotle's meta-semantics results are prophetic. They concern the relationship between the deductive system D and various subsystems of it. Uh, in fact, Aristotle isn't interested in the syntactic structure of the argument apart from semantics. For whether or not a given argument, uh, argument counts as a deduction of syllogism in the prior analytics cannot be judged uh, by attending to the syntactic expressions involved without taking into account their meaning. Aristotle doesn't introduce a canonical way of expressing the premises and conclusions of his deductions, but uses a variety of interchangeable expressions for arguments, such as A predicted of all B, A belongs to all B, A is not uh, the whole of B, and A follows all of B, for example. Aristotle doesn't specify a closed list of canonical expressions to be used in deductions. He doesn't prescribe which expression to use. Any expression is good as long as it has the same. Uh, let's consider uh, a small uh, but often quoted frag fragment of the prior analytics. When Aristotle demonstrates the two premises, M holds of every N and M doesn't hold of some O, yields a conclusion N doesn't hold of some O, he adds, I quote, and if M holds of every N but not of every X, then there will be a deduction from that N doesn't hold of every X. The dem demonstration is the same. Uh, since the Hellenistic uh, times, this fragment drew special attention of commentators. For example, Alexander of Aphrodisias, uh, arguing against the modern, that is Stoics, asserts this is an argument uh, of the sort with the more recent thinkers, Stoics, called subsyllogistic. It takes something equivalent to the syllogistic premises and deduces the same thing from X, uh, from this. From it, excuse me. Uh, I, uh, the more recent thinkers deny that such arguments are syllogism, since they look for the words and uh, the expression. Aristotle, however, looks for the meaning. Uh, as Corcoran writes, it's doubt, doubtful that Aristotle even conceived uh, uh, of a language apart from its intended interpretation. In other words, it seems as Aristotle didn't separate logical syntax from semantics. So the, uh, the freedom of paraphrase, which uh, Aristotle allows himself in representing the interchanging syntactically different argument with the same meaning, implies Lukasevich verdict. Aristotelian logic is formal without being formalistic, whereas the logic of the Stoics is both formal and formalistic. Uh, but logic cannot be schematically formal without being formalistic. The Aristotelian syllogist 
is as a matter theory concerned with the formal relations between perfect and imperfect rules of inference, rather than with the canonical structures of categorical statement, statements. Uh, Aristotle requires that uh, ev everything relevant to an argument, arguments count counting as a deduction, should be made explicit by some linguistic expression. As Marco Marin uh, pointed out, un unlike the topic, topics, the prior analytics provide a criterion for de 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 determining when no premise is missing in a given argument. Uh, here is an example. <laughs> of course, uh, this is uh, an important uh, task of logic. As uh, Joseph Bohensky writes, for example, the whole business of formal logic is to make tacit uh, assumptions of reasoning explicit. To deny this physics would consequently be to contradict the very nature of formal logic, not only as it is now, but as it, is, as it has always been since the time of Aristotle. On the other hand, Bohensky insisted on the unity of logic and ontology. For Bohensky, I quote, both disciplines uh, now appears to be sets of statements about being or general as a physics of the, of the object in general. Ontology is, is for Bakensky a non-formal, intuitive in inquiry into the basic properties and basic as aspects of entity in general. Logic has been merely the technical elaboration of an ontology. Is it, is it possible to find the, this technical elaboration of the ontology in the modal theoretical approach to the thesis that formal or in logic, in logic corresponds to abstraction from matter. Uh, modal theoretical approach to formality goes back to Bernard Bartzan. Bartzan's logic, logic addresses an objective mind, mind independent proposition in itself and an objective idea in itself. Uh, for Bajzana, deducibility is defined in terms of truth preservation from a collection of premises to a collection of conclusions and the variation of a collection of ideas. Uh, so, uh, according to Bajzana, deducibility or consequence relation is determined by a Validity preserving variability of ideas in themselves. To consider an idea of variable is a, in a given proposition means to take the class of uniform propositions. For Bartzana, I quote, um, the concepts that make up the invariant part of this proposition all belong to logic. Uh, generally, it's possible to regard any sets as, uh, of, idea, of ideas as concepts constant, that is, logic. Oh, but, uh, in contrast, uh, Alfred Tarski explains the concept of logical notions as exactly those which are invariant and arbitrary permutations of the underlying domain of individuals. In his famous lecture, What are Logical Notions? He proposed uh, a call, to call a notion logical, if at only if, I quote, it is invariant under all possible one one transformations of the world onto itself. By notions, uh, Tarski doesn't uh, understand linguistic expressions or conceptual entities, but objects in the world, including uh, individuals, properties of sex, relations, and functions. Functions. Uh, his definition of logical notions uh, extend to the domain of logic, Klein's Erlanger problem. Uh, Felix Klein uh, proposed to classify various uh, geometries according to invariants and a suitable group of transformations. Klein suggested that each geometric field can be characterized by the invariance conditions satisfied by, it, by its notion, notions. Uh, we can restrict or increase the transformations taken into account, getting more specific or more general geometrical notions. Plan geometric invariance has a following form. Definition for 
ge geometric notion or is invariant under all one one transformations of the geometric of space onto itself, which is uh, X. Uh, by stretching X, we restrict the transformation taken into account, getting more specific geometrical notions. By weakening X, we increase the transformation taken into account, getting more general notions. Now, Tarski asked, what would happen if we weakened X as much as possible? That is, if we set no requirements on the transformations taken into account. The answer uh, is his famous notion of permutation invariance. This invariance takes all one-one transformations into account and as a, as a result, characterizes according to Tarski our most general notions. What is the science which studies these notions? For Tarski, the science is logic, not geometry. Uh, in this way, Tarski stresses the uh, correlation between logic and geometry and at the same time, the greater generality of logic. Geometries are characterized by transformations respecting some structure of space, abstracting from any kind of special feature of the universe in order to get to the most general notion, notions, we just end up with all permutations. Uh, if we interpret formality of a theory as its invariance on the permutations of the universe, uh, it means that the theory doesn't distinguish individual objects and characterizes only those property of the uh, model which do not depend on its non-structural transformations. For Tarski, the class of permutations is the most general class of non-structural transformations because permutations do, do not represent uh, any extra structure. To sum up, according to Tarski, logic deals with our most general notions, which are invariant under all one-one transformations on the world into itself. Definition six here. Uh, uh, as it was shown by Van Magie, an operation is logical according to Tarski's criterion, if it only if, it is definable in the infinitary language, which allows conjunction and disjunction uh, of any cardinality, together with universal existential quantification over sequences of variables of any cardinality. This theorem of Magi. This infinitary language uh, is powerful enough to express substantial set theoretical claims. Thus, the permutation invariance criterion assimilates logic to set theory. Because of the overgeneration of the, this criterion and its undergeneration with respect to modal logic, permutation invariance cannot be considered as a necessary and sufficient criterion of logicality. For example, according to Tarski criterion, S5 necessity operator must be considered as a logical constant, but not the S4 necessity operator since it pays attention to the structure that is uh, the accessibility relations on the domain. And the structure is not preserved by all permutations of these domains. In the opinion of uh, Katarina dutil Navash, the, this ex, uh, extension of in a, in a, uh, inadequacy of the in, uh, invariance criteria is a symptom of its conceptual inadequacy. Uh, in other <laughs> okay. <laughs> the, uh, I quote, the criterion pertains fundamentally to the numerical identity of objects, that is to quantities and numbers as rightly noted by Tarski. Uh, if one does maintain the quantification is the very core of logic, the, the implementation and variance might be just what we need to demarcate logic. However, the claims here is that to reduce logic to quantification phenomena is a mistake. Actually, uh, Tarski proposed the following philosophical generalization of his invariance criteria. Our logic is logic of cardinality. As Tarski remarks, I quote, it turns out that our logic is even less than the logic of extension. It is a logic of number 
of numerical relations. He writes that the only properties of classes of individuals which are logical are properties concerning the numbers of elements of these classes. Thus, Tarski doesn't distinguish between logical and numerical relations. Uh, and now I, I will skip this uh, example uh, with poetic quantifiers. I will only note uh, that uh, heterogeneous uh, quantifier prefixes distinguish between equi cardinal relations, and therefore the theory of poetic quantification cannot be considered as Tarski's logic of numerical relations. But uh, what is important now is so I skip this example. And uh, for my topic uh, today, it's important that for, from Husserlian perspective, there is no overgeneration problem with Starsky invariance criteria. Uh, Husserl emphasizes the um, inseparable unity, he said, of logic and mathematics that hasn't been realized because of the normative representation of logic as an instrument of psychology and metaphysics. Uh, for, for him, I quote, the whole of pure logic is to be understood as a formal ontology. The lowest level, apophantic logic, investigates what we can st state uh, on uh, the first level about object in general. The high ontologists are concerned with purely formally determined higher level object formation, like set, cardinal name, numbers, and so on. So Husserl doesn't consider mathematics as a regional ontology, but speaks uh, about different le levels of formal ontology. According to Balzana, uh, formal disability also has many levels. Balzana's method uh, of variation of idea doesn't include uh, the a priori specification of the class of logical or invariable ideas in themselves for all proposition in themselves. In contrast, selecting a class of invariable ideas determines deducibility for uh, some. <laughs> Excuse me. We are here. Okay. Uh, in modern logic, the idea that formal models can be constructed at different levels correspond nicely corresponds to the constructionism philosophy of logic. According to design oriented understanding of logic, I quote Patrick Allo, uh, it is a part of the conceptual framework we use to access the world. In the sense that it tells us how to reason about the world, but also in the sense that it determines which models of the world can actually be constructed. From this perspective, abstractions used in logic should be considered as technological devices of our conceptual design. Now it's high time to, to clarify what, is, what we mean by abstraction in the theory of the levels of abstraction. Uh, as Alo uh, pointed out, uh, the basic idea is this. When in a model we omit a certain property, such that its actual presence or absence doesn't make a difference for the, mo for the model, uh, for that model, we say we abstract from it. For instance, if two states satisfy the same set of conditions expect for one, say P, then making an abstraction from P renders P and non-P states undistinguishable. Undistinguishable, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, in general, we may say that by making abstraction from a set of properties, we move from a level of abstraction which discriminates between states uh, which do and do not satisfy certain combinations of these properties to a level of abstraction on which such distinctions can no longer be made. According to Luciano Flority, definition seven, 
a level of abstraction is a finite but not empty set observable. What is observable? An observable is an inter interpreted type of variable. That is a type of variable together with a statement on to, on, of what features of the system under consideration is it represents. A type of variables is a uniquely named uh, conceptual entity that is the variable and a set uh, called a type, the, its type, uh, consisting of all the values that uh, the entity may take. Uh, as Allo pointed out, one way to formalize the flow of information between levels of abstraction is through the ap application of John Van Rice and Jerry Seligman's notion of infomorphism, not isomorphism, but infomorphism to the uh, uh, relative translation between logical theories proposed in the, uh, their uh, famous book, in Information Flow. The basic idea of uh, infomorphism uh, is that of a relation between classifications. So let's move to classifications. What is classification? Uh, classification uh, consists of uh, definition uh, nine. Uh, a classification consists of a set of tokens, a set of types, and a binary relations, a relation between them. Uh, by a token, uh, Barweis and Seligman mean only something that is classified. By type, they mean only something that is used to classify. So a classification consists of a first uh, set of objects, its tokens, which are to be classified. By means of the second set of objects, it's type. The binary relation between them, this set, does uh, exactly this. Uh, the classification of tokens by these uh, types. Barweis and Seligman give us an interesting example. Uh, here, the tokens are mathematical structure, and the types are sentences of the language. And the binary relations between them is satisfaction. Let, let me uh, remember you our definition of abstract logic from the very beginning. An abstract logic consists of a collection of structures closed under isomorphism a collection of formal expressions and a relation of satisfaction between the two. So my proposal is to consider, is very natural, it is to consider abstract logic as classifications by type, uh, by types of isomorphisms. Now it is possible to relate uh, to abstract logic uh, as classifications by means of uh, infomorphism, definition, uh, the last definition is the definition of informatics. Uh, to sum up, <laughs> yeah, you may say that uh, abstract logics are abstract systems, formal ontology, classifications, and levels of abstraction. Abstract logics as abstract systems do not distinguish between specific individuals and the domain. Abstract logic as formal ontology deal with individual of higher order classes of isomorphic structures. Abstract logic as classifications fixes, uh, fixes the levels of abstraction. So uh, the notion of, of abstract logic can help us to relate the notions of abstract system, formal ontology and level of abstraction. Thank you, that's it. Thank you. No question. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. If, uh, that's been a, uh, yes. Uh, say a question. Um, yeah, uh, I'm not sure about my understanding. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> excuse my uh, no, no, English. No, no, <laughs> no, you excuse me. <laughs> and, um, I'd like to um, <clears throat> to check uh, whether uh, I uh, understood correctly one of your claims, namely that uh, abstract logics uh, can be 
thought of as uh, formal ontologies. So uh, uh, the question is, uh, what's formal ontology? I understood uh, you to the effect that uh, formal ontology is a set or a, a class of classes of isomorphic logics, right? Uh, am, uh, am I right? Or... Uh, I start with the uh, definition of Husserl. Uh, yes. This definition, formal ontology is an, uh, as a science. Uh, a priori, it's, it's a difficult uh, question. <laughs> formal ontology is a science of objects in general, okay? Uh, and we can consider uh, isomorphic uh, structures, types of isomorphism as, uh, is, as though uh, objects. objects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my uh, Okay, but uh, 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 my question is, uh, <clears throat> you, uh, you are talking of types uh, of isomorphism. Uh, so, um, isomorphism is uh, a, <clears throat> a, a relation between a certain sort of, uh, between objects of certain sort. And, and structures, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> and uh, structures, mathematical structures, right? Okay. And uh, you mean mathematical structures of any type, not just, not just, uh, what we usually call logics. Uh, uh, logics in, in, in usual uh, uh, speech, so to speak, uh, a logic is, is in usual meaning, um, it is a, a, a structure containing vocabulary, syntax, semantics, uh, proof theory, and so on. So uh, uh, do you take into account only structures of this type or any structures at all? Uh, unfortunately, no, not always of these types. It was shown by Mikey, mm -hmm. the theorem of Mikey. Also, uh, the, the uh, 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 okay, the uh, mathematical structures, also this, the uh, structure from set theory, also corresponds to this understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, he shows that uh, task criterion that uh, invariance mm -hmm. under uh, isomorphic uh, transformations mm -hmm. corresponds to to. The second order logic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a kind of uh, set theory in a sense, in quiet uh -huh. sense, for example. Okay, so so it's it's a very general understanding of uh, formal of logic, not not only of formal ontology but logic. Uh, but um, I I try to to show that uh, uh, Husserl is uh, would be agree with this understanding. He, uh, he combined logic and mathematics in formal ontologies. But it, 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 it's a little bit strange, and I, I, I try to show that, uh, uh, that abstract logic in this sense is classification. That's my point. Uh, not the theory of deduction, mm. but only classification. And in the theory of, level of, of levels of abstraction that Cloridy and his school um, uh, Theory, we can uh, add um, a notion of local uh, local logic. Uh, if we add to these uh, classifications, uh, for example, the, uh, the the theory of uh, of uh, inference, for example, in uh, uh, in nat natural deduction or. Uh, <laughs> Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, some kind of uh, rules of entrance. Yeah. But uh, on the other hand, in modern theoretical logic and generalized model theory, uh, in, uh, these structures are uh, abstract logic. Harvey said, and uh, Kessler and Chen said that it's a logic in this sense. I said in, in Husserl's set. But is it good or not? Or not? Maybe Husserl was wrong. It's not logic. It, it's a kind of classification. Mm. Uh, so we, we should, it, it seems to me that it's, it's uh, usual to add to the, uh, to the uh, abstract logic some uh, notions of the theory of levels of abstractions, because we have many levels and we, we can in this way to, to, to deal with the dynamic of uh, abstraction. Not only the whole uh, Husserlian uh, domain of abstract logic. It's it, it's it's better, it seems to me, in, especially in the situation of logical pluralism. Okay, thank, thank you. you.
Thank you for the question. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. I just uh, would like to make a clarification, some clarification about the status of the statute of the distinguished between syntax and semantics. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to clarify today's claim and I would like for you to say if I'm right on this point. So uh, it seems to me that it means that um, when we have a syllogism with capital letters, then from the status point of view, we do not have uh, inference yet. So we have just a form of inference, but it would be a real inference if we replaced uh, these capital letters with real sentences. So if I'm right with that, then Aristotle does not allow us to, um, us to derivate propositional inferences, uh, propositional letters uh, from propositional letters. Capital, oh, capital letters from capital. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, if I'm right that uh, if Aristotle does not <coughs> distinguish between syntax and semantics, then Aristotle does not know the notion of derivation. Yeah, uh, this is my clarification, and I would like you to say if I'm right. <coughs> so Aristotle doesn't make difference between derivation and inference. In a sense, yes, maybe, yeah. Uh, and I, 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 I should and, think that and it does not allow to make a relation of capital letters, uh, letters from letters. Uh, here is the crucial problem. Uh, yeah, 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 the crucial problem for Aristotle um, and uh, Alexander of, of Rhodesias, who use the term forms for um, syllogistic uh, syllogism. Aristotle didn't use the dichotomy of uh, form and matter. In logic, it's, it's very strange, but uh, it's a fact. Uh, and uh, his pupil, uh, Alexander of Rodinus, used it. But he said that Aristotle looks for the meanings rather than for the words. Uh, and, yeah. but uh, my question was that we can say that some uh, uh, syllogism is invalid if we mm. use just uh, capital letters and we do not know what they, do they mean. And Aristotle also put. Make for uh, excuse me, for, for Aristotle, it is uh, important uh, what means these letters. It's not only syntactical entities for but Aristotle he could, here. Uh, but he could uh, to say that uh, the, you know, the syllogism of such form is invalid. Well, he, uh, uh, yes, it's valid, but also valid invalid. Invalid. Ah. Invalid. invalid. Uh, even if he use just capital letters and not real sentences. He could, uh, to what, what, excuse me, what do you mean we use only capital letters but not sentences? Real capital, sentence. what, what is real sentence? The sentences of Greek language? Yes. yes. <laughs> yes. But he used the sentences of Greek language. And he, he used some unchangeable uh, uh, words for, for, for the form. That's strange. And for us, it's not good. Uh, he, 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 uh, his uh, aim, according to Corcoran, for example, according to Prior, uh, is not to construct a canonical notation. Yeah, uh, all, uh, all notations is good uh, if they have the same meaning. The meaning is important for, uh, for Aristotle's. There are different interpretations of syllogistics, but uh, according to this interpretation, that's the logistic is meta theoretical theory about the inference. It's about the, um, the uh, reducing of uh, imperfect form of syllogism to perfect. But he's not, um, he's not uh, very accurate in our sense as Stoic. Stoic says that it's not good, this, this equivalence between different forms, between different syntactic forms of uh, categorical statement if they uh, have the same meaning. For Aristotle, they, it's the same, and the derivation is the same, the demonstration is the same. For different, syntactically different expressions. For, for Aristotle, uh, the demonstration is the same. For Stoic and for us, it's not the same. OK, yeah. OK, thank you. OK, we have Zoom question. Eleazar Dimi, please. Oh. Elia, hello. Where are you? <laughs> hello? Can hello? you hear me? 
Yes, I, I can hear you, but I can see you. <laughs> oh yeah, okay. So, so yes, welcome. Oh yeah, now it's. Hi. So, sorry, I, um, my camera is not working well. I apologize. Like, oh yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll ask my questions anyways. Uh, uh, I had a question about you. You may uh, so, so there are these uh, opposite problems for the Tarskian the notion of invariance and the permutation, the overgeneration and undergeneration, and you and you you explain how the overgeneration problem is not uh, is not a big problem if one comes from the Husserlian perspective, and, and that was interesting. Uh, but I, I was wondering about the undergeneration problem. So the idea that um, with the Tarskian criteria, we don't vindicate uh, modal operators that are weaker than S5, I guess, for, uh, and so on, which seem uh, important part of logic in the, uh, uh, in the informal, uh, on the informal understanding of logic. Uh, so, so I was wondering whether uh, on your proposal that takes into account also classification and so on, we can uh, also vindicate as logics this, uh, uh, these model logics, or whether they, they still uh, we are still under generating. Uh, thank you, thank, thank you Elena, for your question. So, um, so yeah, uh, under uh, as far as I know, uh, several researchers tried to to solve this problem of under generation of this criteria. I know, for example, that uh, Jochen van Bentham and Denis Bonnet uh, tried to 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 correct this um, uh, this um, uh, this uh, criterion of the invariance under not under permutation, but uh, uh, under isomorphism. It's uh, it's according to uh, so-called um, so-called um, uh, Tarski share. Uh, Tarski share uh, criterion. If you consider different models, it's it's better to to say about uh, isomorphic uh, um, isomorphism, but not about uh, permutations of the domain. So uh, I cannot answer uh, now. I cannot answer to your to your uh, to your wonderful question. But uh, I know that there are some some attempts to solve this problem of under generation. But as um, uh, there are now another problem, not only with model logic, but uh, also with sentential uh, connectives, uh, because this uh, this uh, criterion uh, said uh, about the quantification mostly, uh, but it doesn't didn't said about the um, uh, uh, sentential uh, connectives. But uh, for example, uh, Gilcher uh, said that it's not the problem because. Uh, uh, they are obviously uh, logical. Uh, yeah, that's third answer. Yeah. yeah. So we have at least two problems with under generations: the uh, model uh, notions and uh, sentential connectives. We can separate two, these two problems, but I, I cannot a full answer for your question. I'll try to, to read this article of Van Bentham and, <laughs> and Bonnet. Yeah, thank you, Elie. Okay, thank you very much. It was very interesting. Any other questions? No? Then thank you yeah. so much. Thank for you. The talk. Thank you. And it's time for coffee break. We will get back in. Uh, in uh, about 40 minutes, so let's switch back to Russian. Hey, Stein, hello. Hello, hi. So, are you ready? I am ready when you are. And I think it is also ready. So, let me introduce, let me introduce our key speaker, hey, Stein Linebo, please. Thing, you can start. All right, we're ready to start. I'm having difficulties hearing you, but I hope you hear me well. Yeah? Yes, 
Yes, we can hear you. All right, so you, you hear and uh, see me fine, that's great. And then I'll pull up my slides again. And now that we know that works, and begin now. So uh, uh, thank you for the, uh, the invitation. Uh, now, in uh, happier circumstances, it would have been very nice to, uh, to be there. Uh, alas, uh, circumstances are not so happy. So I wanted to uh, just start by calling attention to the declaration uh, made by the organizing committee of uh, Analytica now. Uh, you've probably all seen this, but uh, let me read it anyway, since I think it's important. So in these difficult and anxious times, uh, the committee declares its commitment to humanist ideals, compassion, and solidarity. We do not welcome the military solutions of any conflict and want to express our empathy and condolences to all the victims and their families, no matter which side they're on. We consider it harmful to divide the research community along any lines, including national and political ones. Science and philosophy belong to humanity as a whole, not to particular social or ethnic groups. So uh, I want to express my agreement with this and uh, uh, encourage everyone else to, uh, to take a similar uh, stance to what's expressed in this very important declaration. So to start the uh, talk proper, my uh, uh, topic will be uh, uh, objects that are thin in the sense that they do not make substantial demands on the world. Uh, objects that come for, for uh, cheap, uh, objects that are undemanding in some way or, or other. And uh, one way of introducing that idea that I quite like is uh, by recalling uh, Hilbert and his view that uh, consistency suffices for existence in mathematics. So you have this uh, uh, famous letter of Hilbert's to, uh, to Frege, uh, where he says that if the arbitrarily given axioms do not contradict each other with all their consequences, then they are true and the things defined by them exist. This is for me the criterion of truth and existence. In mathematics, I'm sure he would add, uh, so uh, in mathematics, it's sufficient that uh, for certain mathematical objects to exist, that you could give an axiomatic theory of them, which is consistent. So that would make mathematical objects really undemanding, really thin in my uh, uh, characterization. Uh, another version of, of this idea comes up in connection with abstraction, and that will be what uh, I'm gonna build on. So uh, you probably all seen Frege on uh, uh, the criterion of identity for directions. So the direction of one line is identical with the direction of another line, just in case the two lines are parallel. And um, that of course expresses a very important truth uh, about directions, but not just that. According to, uh, to Frege and many of the people who have followed him, uh, this also says something about how undemanding directions are. So for the left-hand side here to be true, nothing more is required than the right-hand side. Uh, so Frege talks about the uh, uh, right-hand side being a recarving of the fact expressed by the, uh, the left-hand side. So they somehow come to the same thing in a pretty strong sense. And that Fregean idea, uh, which would also give you uh, thin objects, can be generalized. Since this criterion of uh, identity for directions belongs to a broader family of so-called abstraction principles, where you have certain entities, alpha and beta, and an equivalence relation on those entities, uh, expressed by tilde here, and then you abstract. So you get uh, an abstract object, uh, this one, uh, that's shared by all the alphas that belong to one equivalence class. So that's the idea of thin objects. It's an, ob uh, it's an idea I uh, pursued in a recent book of mine from uh, 
2018 uh, Oxford University Press uh, called Thin Objects, uh, and where I develop exactly the uh, this abstractionist uh, account. So abstraction and grounding is my title. So let me now say a little bit about the second uh, theme here, namely grounding. So that's received a lot of attention in, um, in recent years. Uh, Kit Fine being one of the main expositors and defenders of, of this uh, notion of metaphysical grounding. And he characterizes it as follows. So in addition to scientific or causal explication, there may be a distinctive kind of metaphysical explanation in which explanants and explanandum are connected, not through some sort of causal mechanism, but through some constitutive form of determination. So uh, determination or constitutive determination is one gloss that we get. Another gloss we get is that uh, something metaphysically explains something else, or that something else obtains in virtue of the first uh, fact. So uh, uh, that's the uh, rough idea then of, of what grounding is meant to be. Uh, and we're gonna symbolize this as follows. So phi grounds psi with a less than uh, sign, since it's lower down in the explanatory order. Um, and uh, this will be uh, what's known in the literature as strict and full ground. Strict because it takes us strictly further down in the explanatory hierarchy and full because it's a full explanation. And examples that you come across in the literature then are uh, like the following. Uh, so uh, the truth of two uh, statements explains the truth of their conjunction. Okay, so why is it the case that phi and psi? Well, because phi and psi. Uh, why is it the case that A is red? Well, it's scarlet. That's one way of being red. So that is a full metaphysical explanation of A's being red. And then most interestingly for our purposes, uh, some particles being arranged table-wise, so being arranged in the way that tables are, uh, have to be arranged, uh, or some things have to be arranged uh, in order for us to call that a table, that grounds there being a table. And I say that's interesting because here you have a new object involved on the right-hand side, the table, that wasn't explicitly involved at least on the left-hand side. Okay, so those are our two uh, themes. And then let me uh, move on to uh, why I wish to connect these two uh, themes, abstraction as a way of uh, making sense of thin objects and grounding. So for the uh, thin objects project, there are two main challenges that arise both in my project and more generally when you pursue this idea. And one challenge is, uh, what is this idea of thinness, of making no substantial demand on, on the world? So I gave you a bunch of metaphors, bunch of intuitive ideas here that it's undemanding, coming for cheap, I gave you some examples, but clearly this needs to be made more precise. So we need to say more about what is that notion of thinness. And the second challenge is uh, known as a bad company problem. And that is simply that uh, when you look at uh, good abstraction principles, like Frege's uh, uh, example involving directions, then these good cases are surrounded all around by bad cases, by abstraction principles that are inconsistent or problematic in some, some other way. So one example of, of a bad companion as so called is Frege's basic law five, this one. So the set of Fs for some concept F is identical with a set of Gs, just in case to be an F is uh, comes to the same thing as being a G. Yeah. Okay, so that gives us a naive uh, set theory 
which, as we all know, falls prey to Russell's paradox. So that is certainly a bad companion. And again, one can generalize here and say that a uh, very uh, profligate or, or extravagant, very generous ontologies, uh, quite in general, are prone to paradox. So people who have wanted to posit a lot of objects that have a very generous ontology often run into the problem that uh, among all the objects they posit, uh, there are conflicts. So those are the challenges. And then the uh, idea that I will uh, tell you about today and uh, explain today, defend today, is that uh, it's useful to respond to these challenges in terms of uh, grounding. So uh, for one, uh, it's useful to relate thinness to grounding in ways I'll explain. And also that uh, the uh, response I've been advocating for some time to this bad company problem, that can be usefully expressed in grounding theoretic terms. Uh, where the idea is quite a simple one that the ontology needs to be grounded from the bottom up. So maybe you have some uh, independently given ontology, a domain here of just objects that uh, 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 are fundamental or an empty uh, domain of fundamental things. Then you have more objects whose existence and properties are grounded in that first domain. Now you have yet more objects whose existence and properties are grounded in the foregoing and so on you continue. So successively you account for the ontology from the bottom up. Now, I should be uh, very clear about a limitation of today's investigation. So uh, today I will develop in a way the story I gave in the uh, book that I mentioned from uh, four years ago um, in grounding theoretic terms. And I think there are advantages and disadvantages to uh, developing the story in that way. Uh, uh, important enough advantages to be uh, worth uh, developing this. But among the disadvantages is that um, like some critics here, like Jessica Wilson, uh, I do find it a bit disappointing just to be told that, look, Phi explains Psi without being told more. Uh, so what exactly is this explanation? Uh, can we somehow open that claim and peek in at the inside and see what is the structure of this explanation or be told more? Uh, and that is something I attempt to do in the book to not just talk about metaphysical explanation, but to, uh, to look at how that metaphysical explanation works. But uh, I will not do that today. So today I will operate at a higher level of abstraction where I just use this notion of metaphysical explanation almost as a black box. We have an adequately good understanding of it. We can talk about grounding, uh, so this form of explanation, and put that to use. And benefits of that is that by operating at that higher level of abstraction, we can focus on the, uh, on the big picture, focus on the forest, not the individual trees. And also that uh, grounding is, as I said, something that's getting a lot of attention these days. But it's quite a, a complicated, clunky machinery. And um, uh, it would be good to develop really compelling applications of that machinery to convince everyone that uh, the machinery earns its keep, that it's worth bo bothering with. So I think it is a valuable test case, this, of uh, applying grounding to abstraction, valuable test case for an application of uh, the theory of grounding. So um, let's start on the uh, details. So explaining thinness, um, we need to uh, cash out this uh, uh, characterization that I've given you already, that uh, the demands that um, uh, the uh, identity statement involving two directions, two abstract directions, the demands that the, that statement makes on the world do not go substantially beyond the demands made on the world by the right-hand side. 
What exactly do we mean by that? Well, uh, the first fork in the road here is uh, the idea of not going substantially beyond. There are two ways of cashing that out. Option one is a symmetrical one that uh, the demands of the left-hand side do not go beyond those of the right-hand side at all. They're identical. The two sides make the very same demands on the world. Uh, and another option is to say that, ah, yeah, the demands on the world uh, by the left-hand side, they do go beyond, but not substantially so. So that's what I call an asymmetric picture. The symmetric conception or symmetric picture, um, that's been the dominant one in the literature and in the uh, tradition. Uh, you find that in, in Frege himself, you find it in the neo uh Bob Hale and Crispin Wright. And the most developed defense and articulation of, of the symmetric conception is in this book by Augustine Rayo. And uh, uh, the basic idea is uh, uh, that you, uh, you take the two sides of permissible abstraction principles and say that they make the same demand on the world. You can represent that by means of a, a fat double arrow, which I introduce here. And the characteristic property then is that when you look at any operator, any respect in which you can compare statements, a respect that is concerned solely with how the world is, then of course, if two statements make the same demands on the world, then those two statements will be on a par in every world involving respect. So uh, it is entirely symmetrical. So very symmetrical picture. Uh, I'm unhappy uh, about that symmetrical picture. Um, uh, this is a big debate and I'm just going to give you uh, uh, a very rough and preliminary form of my complaint here. But the complaints uh, that I want to focus on are two. One is that, look, there seem to be worldly respects in which the two sides of an, a permissible abstraction principle are not on a par. So uh, uh, carrying ontological commitment to directions, for instance. Directions are meant to exist in the world, uh, not to be created by us or our use of language. So that ought to be Carrying ontological commitment to directions ought to be a world involving respect. But then the left hand side, the identity statement involving directions, that is committed to directions. The parallelism statement concerning lines is not committed to directions. So this seems to be a case of asymmetry. And another complaint about the symmetrical conception is that there's no assistance here with the bad company problem which is worrisome. And I will now go on to uh, suggest that on the uh, competing asymmetric conception, you do get help with the bad company problem. So um, uh, we'd like to move uh, towards an asymmetric conception of abstraction where you have the two sides of permissible abstraction principles and uh, they're not, entirely symmetrically related. One is committed to objects that the other one is not committed to. So the two sides are not on a par in all worldly respects, but nonetheless, the uh, less uh, uh, demanding side, illustrated here by the parallelism statement involving directions, uh, involving lines, sorry. Uh, nevertheless, that suffices for the uh, more demanding side the identity of their directions. But uh, uh, what is this talk of sufficing? Uh, so that's just a placeholder. And uh, let's see if we could now let grounding do that job. So could the idea be that uh, this side grounds that side, right? So could we have grounding do this job of uh, hashing out how the asymmetric conception is meant to work. So the idea then would be that to not go substantially beyond 
is to be grounded in that other, uh, those other facts that we do not go substantially beyond. And this, as I will uh, go on to explain, also helps a lot with the bad company problem. So we come here to, uh, to a slide which I think is quite important. So this in some ways contains the core of, of the entire uh, talk. So this is, um, this is a very important uh, slide. So here's how I wish to use grounding to respond to the two challenges of articulating thinness and responding to bad company. So with this, we start with the domain D of objects. It could just be uh, the plurality of those many objects. Um, the domain needn't be a further thing if you uh, would rather not. Right, so you have that domain with many objects D. And then the question is how might some extra objects in some extended domain, say D plus, right? So here you add the X shaped object. Uh, how might the objects in the extended domain come for free relative to, uh, to D? i.e. make no substantial further demand. And the guiding idea uh, that I, I will pursue here is that um, if every true literal, so atomic statement or negation thereof, that's solely about the objects in D plus, right? Every uh, atomic statement solely about uh, D plus or negations thereof is either already solely about D or else is grounded in truths that are solely about D. Well, then the objects that D plus adds are thin relative to, to D, right? So let me restate that even more intuitively. You've accounted for some objects, namely the ones in D, and then for some other objects to come for free relative to, uh, to, uh, to D is for the existence of those further objects and all other atomic properties to be grounded in what you have already accounted for. Right? So the grounding bottoms out in what you have already accounted for. That is a kind of relative thinness or coming for free, relatively speaking. And the hope is that in this way, we will solve both challenges in one go. Well, right, since I give you an account of what thinness amounts to, uh, and this also gives a way of successively accounting for bigger and bigger domains. Since now you could look at what's grounded relative to D plus, that yet more objects, and then, then you continue in that way, successively account for a big domain. So one of the things we can do now is to um, uh, distinguish more clearly between uh, coming for free or being thin relative to something else and being thin in an absolute sense. So an object is thin relative to certain other objects. If the former's demands on the world do not substantially exceed the latter's. So if uh, uh, all the, uh, uh, the existence and the properties of uh, the, uh, uh, the objects that come for free relative uh, would be grounded in uh, fact about the, uh, the, uh, the other objects. So an example here would be uh, the existence and properties of an impure set. Uh, so you have the set of uh, all the people following this talk. Uh, the existence of that set, I claim, is grounded in the existence of all of us. And basic properties of, of that set, like me being an element of, of that set, is also grounded in facts about uh, all the things in question, all of us, namely I being one of all of us. And then we can say that an object is thin uh, in an absolute sense if it can be obtained from the empty domain by a sequence of domain expansions. Uh, where uh, each uh, such expansion adds only objects that are thin relative to the preceding domain. Right? So you start with nothing whatsoever, empty domain, you account for some objects, in terms of those you account for yet more, in terms of those yet more, and then you go in that way. 
that will give you objects that are uh, in the uh, grounding uh, community are called zero grounded, successively grounded in nothing whatsoever. Um, and that would be absolutely thin in my terminology. So uh, any pure set, like the empty set or single of the empty set and so on, would be zero grounded or absolutely thin. Now, uh, let's see if we could get a tighter connection now between uh, sufficiency, so this uh, placeholder notion or uh, uh, programmatic notion uh, relation that obtains between the less demanding and the more demanding side of a permissible abstraction. Let's see if we could uh, get a definition of, of that relation of sufficiency in terms of grounding. So could sufficiently simply be grounding? Well, not quite. You need to modify it a little bit. Uh, since grounding is meant to be factive, only true uh, statements or only facts can ground something else. So you've got to conditionalize at least on the right-hand side being true to begin with. So if the right-hand side is true, well, then it gives a strict and full ground of the left-hand side. That's pretty promising. Um, so this will be my take one. Uh, this will be my first attempt. And uh, it's pretty good. It comes pretty close to, uh, to the truth. Uh, I will modify it a little bit later on. Uh, this is basically known as the Schwarzkopf-Rosen principle in uh, the small literature on grounding ab on, uh, and abstraction that already exists. I've been a couple of uh, papers on it, uh, or a generalization of that principle. And let me now, in this slide and the next, give you some examples of how this is meant to work. Examples that uh, suggest that this is very, very promising and uh, can give us a very uh, appealing picture of uh, both the metaphysics and the mathematics of abstraction. So cardinal numbers, uh, I will use a plural logic, so a logic with double variables, which have many values. So uh, a double variable could, could have as its many values, all of us, uh, for instance. Uh, you'll get used to that quickly if you haven't seen it before. It's a version of second order uh, logic, but with no second order objects, uh, you just have the many things that we are talking about, which we are talking about simultaneously by means of a single yet doubled variable. And I will also use a negative free logic. So uh, uh, an identity statement then in effect works as an existence claim. So to ground T is identical with uh, T is to ground T exists. All right. And then we are simply plugging in versions now uh, that uh, come from cardinal numbers of the idea I mentioned. So, well, um, uh, you have some things and some other things, uh, x, x, y, y, could be these fingers and those fingers. If they're equinumerous, which is what I represent by means of uh, this relation, if they're equinumerous or can be put in one-to-one -one correspondence, as you see here, well, then that grounds the identity of their respective cardinal numbers. Okay, so if these things can be put in one-to-one -one correspondence with those things, well, then the number of these is identical with the number of those. And uh, likewise, for the negated case, if these things are not equinumerous with those, well, then their numbers are distinct. And then you have a predecession relation. So uh, uh, this relation is a relation that xx bear to yy, just in case you could remove one of the yy and then get as many things as xx, right? So yy being one more uh, object than xx, stated in terms of equinumerosity in the usual way. So xx being uh, one fewer than yy, while that grounds the number of xx uh, preceding yy, okay? So uh, uh, these four, one fewer than these five. For that reason, the number of these immediately precedes the number of those. 
That's as easy and intuitive as it is. And likewise, again, for the negated case. And in that way, you can play around a little bit and you see that you, uh, you can now actually derive uh, the ordinary version of Hume's principle as it's known, the abstraction principle meant to govern cardinal numbers. So this seems pretty promising. And uh, sets is quite analogous. Now we look not at equinumerosity or being one-to-one -one correlated, but coextensionality. So if uh, some things are coextensive with some other things, well, then their sets are identical. Yeah. So uh, coextensionality of some things with some other things would ground the identity of their corresponding sets. And through that also the existence of their set. X being one of some things grounds X being one of the set of those things. And likewise for the negated cases. So in particular, then you have uh, any plurality uh, being equinumer, uh, sorry, being coextensive with itself, that grounds the existence of the corresponding set. And I like to think of this as a version of the iterative conception of sets as you have it in Gödel, for instance, uh, where Gödel talks about a set of operation that you could apply to any things so as to form or define their uh, set. So you have a grounding theoretic version of that idea here. Again, you derive a version of the uh, corresponding abstraction principle. This is a plural version of basic law five. So this should make us all a little bit anxious since basic law five is dangerous, as I told you. Uh, if you're not careful, that will fall prey to, uh, to Russell's paradox. So we will have to be careful here, but stay tuned. I will get back to, uh, to the needed care. So uh, I'm gonna give you some uh, uh, pictures here, uh, which illustrate uh, how this works or at least is meant to work. So can we do the famous kind of Phrygian bootstrapping where you have some numbers based on which you establish the existence of yet more numbers, based on which you establish the existence of even more uh, numbers? So this is how this would work. Let AA be any singleton plurality. So it could be just me. Um, I'm equinumerous with myself, or the plurality of me is equinumerous with itself. Well, that grounds the existence of the cardinal number one. So now you have one more object, namely me and the cardinal number one. So the plurality of me and the cardinal number one, that's around and equinumerous with itself. This is grounded in the existence of one and the self equinumerosity of me, basically just the existence of me. And so these two come together and ground this one. So we have grounded this. And now you have a, a two member in plurality equinumerous with itself. Well, that grounds the existence of two. Right, and now you have one more object which you could add to the plurality here. So you get a three membered plurality, uh, equinumerous with itself, which grants the existence of three. And off you go. Well, you establish the existence of each and every natural number in that way. Uh, and um, you could do the same thing in the case of sets. Any plurality is coextensive with itself, which grounds the existence of the set. So now you have a larger plurality, which you could use to ground the existence of yet more sets. And again, you can continue in that kind of way. So it all looks very promising. However, there are uh, difficulties here. There are problems. So uh, what I'm gonna do next, now that I have uh, laid out the uh, uh, basic picture. So in this slide, which I said was very important uh, uh, of having uh, established some ontology and then grounding the existence of properties of some further objects in that old ontology. Uh, I've taken that idea, I've illustrated uh, 
how that would work in the case of cardinal numbers, in the case of sets, it all seems very promising. But there are some difficulties uh, pointed out in, in a very important and very nice paper by Tom Donaldson. And what I will go on to do now is to uh, probably a little bit uh, faster than I have uh, done so far, uh, say something about the problems, what the problems are and how I want to respond to them. But I think it makes sense to uh, spend a good amount of time as I have done on getting the ideas across and then uh, a little bit faster on the, on the problems. So uh, one problem I call the problem of wayward grounding. And uh, uh, we ask now what grounds one of these equinumerosity truths. So for instance, uh, these things being equinumerous with those things, what really grounds that? Well, uh, when you look at how that's analyzed ordinarily, it says that there uh, is a relation that one-to-one -one correlates these and those. And that involves quantification over absolutely everything. So for any object, if it's one of these, well, then it's uniquely associated with one of those. Right? So you have unrestricted universal and existential quantifiers here. And then um, uh, the nice observation Donaldson makes is that uh, when you look at the question of how universal generalizations are grounded, the standard view is that a universal generalization to the effect that everything says phi is partially grounded in each and every instance uh, of the form A is phi. Okay, so the problem now should be pretty apparent, even if the details are a little bit uh, tricky. An equinumerosity statement like these are equinumerous with those. That involves universal generalization over all objects whatsoever. So among the objects you will generalize over are numbers that are higher up in this nice hierarchy, this grounding hierarchy that I had on one of the preceding slides now. So uh, uh, a claim involving, say, the number, uh, natural number one, will be grounded when you look at the details here in something like two being distinct from zero, which concerns an object that is higher up in the grounding hierarchy. But that's precisely what should not happen. So we want everything at one level of the hierarchy to be grounded in what's strictly below, not to be partially grounded in what intuitively seems to be above. So the grounding chains are wayward or they're going off in bad directions here. There is a solution here, and uh, uh, the intuitive idea behind my solution is uh, very, very simple. So take an equinumerosity statement like these five fingers are equinumerous with those five fingers. Properly analyzed, that equinumerosity statement is solely about these objects and those objects. No other objects beyond these and those need to enter the picture. Right? So there's no need to quantify or look at all of the remainder of reality. Uh, just look at these things and those things. Right? So it should be possible to analyze these equinumerosity statements in a way that make them be solely about the optics in question. Uh, you can spell that out in detail, and I do hear um, the important thing to um, pick up here is that when you have a, a universal generalization that is restricted to a plurality, so the one I underlined, every one of these objects is phi, then that will be fully grounded in instances drawn from these objects. So it will be fully grounded, as I put it here, in what are called the critical instances namely instances that are drawn from the plurality to which you restrict the universal generalization, right? To say that every one of these is phi is grounded in first one of these uh, being phi, second one of these being phi, and so on. No need to look at anything else. So in that way, you uh, uh, make good on the intuitive idea in the previous slide in that equinumerosity statements really properly analyzed are just about the objects involved 
that are said to be equinumerous. So you avoid the wayward grounding phenomenon. And this means that uh, the nice picture that I had on one of the earlier slides, this one, really is correct. That when you look at what grounds, say, this equinumerosity, the threat was that that would involve grounding from above, from higher up in the hierarchy, because of the wayward grounding phenomenon. But that is not so. It really is grounded in what we had. So this threat does not materialize. And you do indeed have the nice picture that uh, we have in this diagram. And uh, it's particularly attractive then if you allow uh, an empty plurality. So suppose you allow a plurality of nothing whatsoever. I'm calling that E, uh, E, E. Uh, of course, we don't recognize such pluralities in uh, uh, English or Russian for that matter, I assume. Uh, uh, but uh, it's logically permissible. It's a, a logic, perfectly respectable logical language to, uh, to use, is the claim. So we could have an empty plurality, then no things whatsoever being equinumerous with no things whatsoever. Well, that's grounded in nothing whatsoever. That is zero grounded. That ground zero. And then you have a one member plurality uh, whose self and equinumerosity grounds the existence of one, and off you go. So now you get the picture that all of the natural numbers, each of the natural numbers is zero grounded or absolutely thin. And we move on to the second and last of the two Donaldson problems that I, I wanted to mention. And um, this uh, problem arises because something very strange happens with abstraction on cardinal numbers. So first, let's look at a case where this strange phenomenon does not arise, namely set abstraction. So when you obtain a set by abstraction, you start with a plurality of independently given things. And then, so first you have those uh, things that will be the elements of, of the set, then you get the set. So the set cannot itself be an element. The set can't be an element of itself since you need first to have the elements and only out of those elements can you form or ground the existence of the set. But cardinal numbers are different. So a cardinal number can be obtained by abstraction on a plurality that involves that very number. So consider the plurality, uh, the one-membered plurality consisting of just the cardinal number one. That is a perfectly respectable one-membered plurality. Now we do cardinal abstraction on that one membered plurality. And of course, the cardinal number of any singleton or one membered plurality is one. So this is one, and that is a member of the plurality with which we started. So now you can abstract on a plurality and obtain a member of that plurality in a way that's very different from the case of, of sets. And this causes trouble on the analysis of sufficiency as con conditional grounding that we have been operating with. Um, and the trouble is nicely illustrated by a simple diagram here. So you could take it in uh, uh, pictorially. Um, so existence of uh, the cardinal number one, that's a fact. Uh, that fact grounds the equinumerosity of the singleton of that number with itself. Equinumerosity facts are grounded in just the existence of the uh, involved objects and distinctness facts uh, among those objects. So in this case, uh, grounded just in the existence of one. And now that grounds in turn uh, the existence of one. So you have the existence of one grounding itself, but that is not acceptable in the standard theory of grounding since nothing is, is meant to uh, ground itself. No fact can ground itself. Grounding is meant to be irreflexive. Okay, so something has gone wrong here. 
Now, uh, what gave rise to the problem, thankfully also gives us a way of responding to the problem. So what gave rise to the problem is that there are so many ways of uh, obtaining uh, the uh, existence of one by abstraction. You could abstract on any one-membered plurality so as to, uh, to get the existence of, of that object. There are many routes into the existence of uh, cardinal number one. Any singleton plurality will do. Uh, Right? And that meant that one of the ways you could obtain cardinal number one was by abstracting on the plurality of cardinal number one. But thankfully, uh, there are also other routes that do not involve cardinal number one, like Obama exists. And uh, uh, the single, singleton plurality of Obama is equinomous with, with uh, itself, which grounds the existence of cardinal number one. So now you have a, a, a way of grounding that that doesn't involve one. That grounds all that higher stuff again. And now you would have been capable here of grounding the existence of one since you have a single plurality uh, uh, equinumerous with itself. But this has already been grounded. So there's no further grounding work to, to do. So there is a perfectly respectable way of grounding all the facts that we want. That uh, makes us hopeful, at least, that um, there is a solution. And we can spell out the details in a couple of different ways. To uh, conserve time here, I think I will uh, skip over the uh, uh, two first ways of doing it and focus just on the third option, which is my preferred one. And that is to, uh, to say that these relations of sufficiency I have been talking about where the right-hand side of the permissible abstraction principle suffices for the left-hand side, like parallelism of two lines sufficing for identity of their corresponding uh, directions. That isn't quite grounding, but rather records an explanatory argument a metaphysical, uh, uh, explanatory metaphysical argument. And then we can use such arguments to derive information about grounding. So we start with the explanatory arguments. Out of the explanatory arguments, you first obtain relations of what's known as weak grounding. So you can may think of weak grounding as standing to strict grounding, which is what we have talked about so far, kind of like less than or equal stands to strictly less than. Right? So weak grounding uh, is something that grounds or gives a complete metaphysical explanation and for sure doesn't take you up in the explanatory hierarchy, but it may not take you strictly down. You may remain at the same level. Right, so explanatory arguments like uh, the ones that obtain between right-hand sides and left-hand sides of abstraction principles, they give us weak grounding. And then you can look at these chains of weak grounding. And if they always go just in a single direction, so if they are unidirectional, they can't be turned around. Well, then you have strict grounding. So this is uh, a material that I'm uh, currently uh, spelling out in, in proper detail in a, a joint work with Louis de Rosset. Um, all right, so let us take stock here and then I'll use the last five minutes on the uh, second aim and say a little bit about uh, the bad company problem. So the first aim was to explain the idea of thin objects in terms of rounding. We have looked at abstraction, said that the left-hand sides uh, ground the uh, right-hand sides or something very close to that at least. Um, there were the uh, two Donaldson problems, uh, wayward grounding, uh, which arose because of this idea that true universal generalizations now, uh, they are grounded in everything whatsoever, uh, which sends you off with grounding chains all over the place. Uh, and I responded to that by saying that, no, no, a true universal generalization restricted to a plurality is grounded just in instances 
drawn from among that polarity. That was one thing I did. The other thing I did was to say that, look, this notion of sufficient, it wasn't quite exactly strict grounding. It's rather recording an explanatory argument out of which you derive the information about strict grounding. So that solves the other problem. Now, the bad company problem. Now, uh, bad cases of abstraction, which we need to uh, deal with. So we would like a natural class of abstraction principles, all of which are permissible. Right? So a systematic way of uh, distinguishing the good from the bad uh, and uh, a large and natural class of good cases. And I will do that by using the grounding machinery I've been setting up here to give you a kind of iterative conception of abstraction. And this will be, unsurprisingly, since I've said this before, an instance of uh, what I'm calling the guiding idea of you have some objects in the domain T, Relative to that, you obtain more objects in an extended domain D plus, and where all uh, atomic and negated atomic statements uh, about the extended uh, domain are grounded in statements about the old domain. So as I will put it here, you have some old objects, old because you have accounted for them already, and then you have some new objects. And the constraint I will put in place now to deal with bad company is to insist that all literals about the new objects have got to be grounded in fact solely about the old objects. Right? So I've got something I've accounted for, and then I want to use that to account for some new objects, further objects, use that and nothing beyond that. Right, so I'm strictly building on what I've got in order to account for some more. And the discipline involved here and uh, in, in constraining this process will come by from the grounding machinery. And to show you how this works, I will give you two examples uh, having to do with two versions of basic law five. So first, a plural version of the law, uh, which is the one you have seen already. So some things uh, being coextensive with some things, uh, that grounds uh, the existence of the course, identity, uh, sorry, of the corresponding sets. Uh, uh, one thing being one of some things grounds that thing being an element of the set of those things uh, and so on. And then what I want you to note here is that on the right-hand side, we talk about various new objects, new sets, right? So I have the old objects here. Maybe these are XX, uh, these are YY, okay. Um, um, so we get then set of XX, set of YY, these are new objects. And then I propose uh, a way of grounding atomic and negated atomic properties of the new objects. And what I want, which is what you have on the right hand side here. And what I want you to very carefully observe here is that the proposed ground is always solely about the old objects. Right? So what grounds the existence of, uh, what, what grounds set of XX being identical with set of YY? Well, that's grounded in XX being the very same things as YY. But that is solely about the old objects, right? You only have to look at the old objects here. Likewise, uh, what grounds X being an element of the set of YY? Well, that's X being one of YY. But X and YY are old objects, so the proposed ground is solely about old objects. So we are now uh, adhering to the requirement of grounding atomic properties of the new, in fact, about the old. So this is okay. And then the uh, familiar and problematic conceptual version of basic law five is not so well behaved. And that's a good thing since now we have a reason to, a principled reason to, uh, to say that that one is unacceptable. 
So look now at um, uh, the class of Fs is identical with the class of Gs. That's grounded in uh, uh, every F is a G and vice versa. Now F and G are concepts here. So to ensure that every F is a G and vice versa, you need to quantify over all of reality, absolutely all objects, to pick up each and every F and ensure that that F is indeed also G. Right? Since unlike the case of pluralities, uh, where you have, you say that here are some objects, I want you to consider those and those only, and uh, here are some other objects, consider those and those only. Here you just look at concept F and concept G, and I ask you to check that every F is a G and vice versa. And to check that, you've got to scan all of reality, finding each and every F, and likewise for the Gs. So the proposed grounds here, what you have on the left-hand side, are not solely about the old objects. If you want the details, here is a worked out example that shows uh, a case where one of the uh, atomic statements about a new object is not grounded in a statement that is solely about the old ontology. We could talk about the details in discussion if you wish. So we have now a solution to the bad company problem. And the solution is simply to take what we have seen in the previous two slides and generalize. So I'm saying that abstraction is permissible if two requirements are satisfied. So our, at least in those cases, abstraction is permissible. So when you abstract on pluralities and you have an equivalence relation and maybe uh, formulas that you want to define properties of the uh, abstract objects. And uh, these statements are solely about XX and YY. Okay, that ensures that the proposed grounds that I'm gonna use are solely about the old objects. Okay. And then of course the equivalence here needs to be a congruence with respect to the property. That's something we always have. Then um, uh, congruence uh, in the sense of that holding. So when those requirements are met, this one that you always have to impose in uh, cases of abstraction, so nothing new in, in my account here, the novelty of what I'm proposing lies here of saying that the relation that you abstract on and any uh, formula that you want to define uh, a property of the abstract objects, these need to be solely about the old objects. Then when those requirements are met, you can use abstraction, you can abstract, and you have the, the picture of what grounds what that generalizes what we have seen already. So, um, and you could prove the consistency of this. Um, so this is uh, probably a safe way to proceed. Uh, so we uh, have now, I propose, uh, I contend, uh, solved both of the challenges in, in one go. Uh, this requires you to be careful about the logic of plurals. So plurals need to be uh, bounded or pluralities need to be bounded in the grounding hierarchy. Uh, in a way we can talk about in the uh, discussion. I'm gonna skip over that, uh, just announce that yes, we need to be careful about uh, the logical plurals there. Uh, and rather just sum up, I, I think I started uh, uh, 9.35 my time, so I'll use one minute to, to sum up and, and finish right on, on the hour. Um, so, um, uh, the two challenges then uh, facing uh, the attempt to develop an abstractionist approach to uh, thin objects, tell us what uh, objects being free amounts to and solve the bad company problem. And I propose that you can use grounding to uh, respond to both of these challenges. So uh, uh, understand sufficiency, as an explanatory argument from which we derive relations of grounding, pure abstract objects, especially pure sets, then come out as zero grounded, that's appealing. 
abstraction on pluralities under an equivalence relation that's solely about these pluralities. That's particularly attractive. That gives you a permissible abstraction. And that's also by enforcing uh, the expectation of thinness that we have here. We solve the bad company problem. So this kind of unified way of solving the problem I find particularly attractive. But let me stop there so we have time to discuss. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Einstein. We have about 30 minutes for questions. So, are there any questions? Yeah. So, please can speak. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The professor, can you hear me? I hear you adequately. Yes, not super well, but uh, so if you speak clearly, it should be fine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for very much for your talk and for your participation in this conference. I really appreciate it. So, uh, my question is about uh, relation between uh, concepts of metaphysical explanation grounding on the one side and the notion of supervenience relation on the other side. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm, we can say that facts about abstract objects can be grounded uh, in facts about concrete objects. And can we say in the same manner that uh, abstract objects can supervene on concrete objects? What do you think? Yeah, good. How, how do you associated grounding and and uh, supervenience and supervenience yeah so supervenience understood in the ordinary sense as a modal covariance so something supervenes on something else if uh, uh, necessarily uh, any difference among the former will correspond to an underlying difference among the latter. So, um, or to turn it around necessarily, if uh, at, uh, two objects are alike with respect to base level properties, they will be alike with respect to uh, the supervening properties. Yeah, so we have we have the ordinary notion of supervenience, uh, which is um, related to, uh, to grounding, but less fine grained. So um, uh, supervenience really doesn't see differences uh, when you look at uh, uh, necessary truths. So when you look at uh, mathematical objects, supervenience is not a very good tool since, um, I don't know, take, um, take sets at, or take, no, yeah, let's use uh, the example of sets. And, and then we, uh, we want to, uh, to use the uh, example of uh, properties of sets of uh, uh, individuals being grounded in just properties of those individuals, as I talked about. And so we had uh, uh, this one, basically. Uh, and then we try to tell that story in terms of supervenience. So uh, then it would be that properties of sets of, uh, of these individuals supervene on properties of the individuals. But that doesn't really uh, do very much at all since uh, the uh, properties of the sets would be uh, uh, necessary. Uh, so, uh, uh, Properties about uh, uh, numbers would also supervene on, uh, on the same base, since you're dealing with all necessary truths there. So the grounding apparatus that I, I propose to bring to bear uh, is much more fine-grained than, uh, than supervenience. That's the main difference. So yes, you can make the claims you, you mentioned uh, about supervenience, but uh, you uh, fail to pick up on very important distinctions here that the uh, grounding apparatus allows you to, to pick up on and record. Does that help? Don't you feel a little bit strange uh, 
about this claim that uh, abstract objects can supervene on concrete. Uh, if you acknowledge that we can say so, mm -hmm. but, uh, do, do, do you feel something strange in this? No? Yeah, so, um, um, yeah, there is something a bit strange about it. I, I agree, but when you look at the, um, uh, when you look at the um, uh, definition of it, it's, it's, uh, it is a, a, a predictable consequence. So when two, this is how I like to think of it. When two objects are alike with respect to base level properties, then they must be alike with respect to the supervening properties. Yeah. So I'm letting this equivalence be uh, the property of being alike with respect to base level properties, and this uh, the property of being alike with respect to higher level properties. And then uh, this needs to hold uh, with necessity, this conditional. So what happens there is that when the properties here are necessary, like properties of mathematical objects are, then supervenience comes for free, yeah. So properties of uh, cardinal numbers, say, uh, two preceding three, uh, three preceding four, et cetera, uh, they will supervene on anything whatsoever. And um, uh, that's totally uninformative. So yes, you get supervenience, but it doesn't say anything. It, uh, supervenience is a wrong tool to, uh, to analyze uh, uh, relations of uh, determination among abstract objects and among objects whose properties tend to be necessary. So it, it, I, I assure your sense that it feels wrong, but it comes out uh, true, and it uh, just just means that supervenience is not a good tool to uh, to analyze uh, uh, relations of uh, determination among the abstract objects that we talk about here. I see, but my my great concern is that non-trivial questions about the supervenience of abstract on concrete, or even the question of existence of abstract objects. Becomes mm -hmm. tri trivial from this point of view. So mm -hmm. non-trivial uh, claim becomes trivial. This is yeah. a little bit strange for me. It is a strange thing, yeah. So I think it's much better to uh, to uh, to use uh, grounding uh, rather than supervenience, since then it's it's no longer trivial. Um, so, so then, so uh, I'm if sorry, uh, do not huh? use this notion here. I'm sorry? The, the answer is uh, do not use this notion of superiority here in this. Uh, for that purpose, that, that's right. Yeah, it's a good notion for, for many purposes. Uh, so in the philosophy of mind, for instance, where it's been used a lot, I think that's a, a, a pretty good tool to, to use. Um, I guess there is a debate to be had there too about whether one should talk more about grounding and less about supervenience. So perhaps, but it's not a bad tool supervenience in, in the philosophy of mind debate, but in uh, philosophy of mathematics, it simply isn't the right tool. Thank you for your questions. Uh, we have Zoom questions uh, from Nikolai Tarabanov. Nikolai, please. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I do, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, well, I've listened to you a uh, second time. The first one was two years ago at uh, Lunaga, Lugana. Lugana, yeah. So, uh, and uh, I read the uh, first two parts of your book and uh, I'm not very strong in formalization, so I have a general question uh, mm -hmm. about uh, abstract concrete uh, distinction. Mm -hmm. So uh, you use uh, such, uh, I guess, um, special metaphors uh, like uh, thin, uh, grounding. Mm -hmm. And as you know, um, that, uh, there is an account uh, uh, of uh, abstract objects uh, like uh, 
uh, are non-spatial, non-spatial mm -hmm. rule. And um, I really like uh, your idea that uh, it's useful to relate thinness to grounding. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, do you think that uh, maybe um, maybe um, we can say that uh, any object uh, is abstract uh, itself? So maybe uh, abstraction uh, abstraction principles are grounded in any object. So maybe uh, this is a quite uh, metaphysical question. So uh, what do you think, uh, how are your findings uh, related to um, abstract concrete distinction? Thank you. Uh, yeah, good. That's, that, I'm very glad you asked me that since I, I do talk about that quite a bit in my book and didn't really bring that up at all in this talk. So um, uh, what I'm calling the guiding idea here, that applies also, that applies to all objects, uh, abstract and concrete. Well, let me let me begin by, by just saying that uh, by abstract, I will mean uh, the rough and ready uh, characterization that uh, you find in the literature that uh, an object is abstract if it's not located in space and time, and it's not causally efficacious. Okay, so abstract is to, uh, uh, concrete is, is to be located in space and time, abstract is not to be uh, so located. And then uh, when you look at the uh, uh, guiding idea here, then uh, it really talks about objects quite in general. So uh, if you have an object, all of whose properties are grounded in some other objects, properties or, or facts about some other objects that you have already accounted for, then that object will be thin relative to, uh, to those other objects. So for instance, one of these objects could be a table. Remember that example from uh, right at the beginning of the talk that uh, the existence of a table is grounded in some things being arranged table-wise. So you have some uh, uh, particles that are arranged the way a table, you need to, to arrange objects to, uh, to have a table. So the existence of the table would then be grounded in the existence of the individual things arranged in the way they have to be arranged to, uh, to have a table. And you and I, our existence uh, would be uh, 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 grounded in uh, the existence and properties of, of, of something more basic. The material out of which we're made uh, being one thing, the organization of us, uh, of course, a, a major further factor. But yeah, you have all kinds of objects that are thin in a relative sense. The big difference between abstract objects and uh, concrete objects is really just that uh, the abstract objects can be grounded in nothing whatsoever. They can be zero grounded. But you and I, uh, we, our existence uh, uh, requires there to be composing particles. Right? So you need the material out of which each one of us is, is made. And that material is of course located in space and time so the only thing that would ground your existence is, uh, or involves at the very least, the material out of which you're made. And that material is spatiotemporally located. So you're spatiotemporally located, meaning that you are concrete and not abstract. So, um, so that's a gist of it, that uh, uh, abstraction, a kind of abstraction can work also for concrete objects. But, uh, uh, and then you get objects that are thin in a relative sense. So thin relative to, uh, to the material out of which those objects are built. But what they are thin relative to is itself something relatively demanding. So for that reason, uh, you and I are not uh, thin in an absolute sense, uh, only in a relative sense. Does that help? 
Yeah, thank you. So um, uh, you admit um, abstract contract uh, distinction. Am I uh, am I right? Yeah. Do you admit? I, I do have an abstract concrete distinction, that's right. Mm -hmm. So I do want to distinguish the, the abstract from the uh, concrete, yeah. And uh, separately from, from that, you have, um, uh, yeah, so you, uh, you have that distinction and separately from that, you have a, a question of whether the optics is fundamental. Uh, i.e. not grounded in anything else or not, okay? Uh, and then when you look at concrete objects, then there presumably are some that are fundamental. Maybe, I don't know, I don't have a, a, a fixed view on that, but say um, uh, fundamental particles in the case of physics, they just exist. There's no deeper explanation of why they exist. That's just what they do. Uh, while uh, a table is non-fundamental, its existence is grounded in something else. And then when you look at abstract objects, then uh, they are, their properties are grounded in something else. So they are not non-fundamental. So I'm denying that there are fundamental abstract objects. But I do have two different uh, axes of comparison here. So grounded or not, and then abstract or concrete. So you're absolutely right that I, I do recognize the abstract versus concrete distinction. And separately from that, I have a fundamental versus not distinction. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I have more questions, but uh, there is another one. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yes, the next question is from Elia Zardini. Please, Elia. Hi, Elia. Hi, can you hear me? Oh, yes, well, yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I had a question about the, the, the auto abstraction uh, problem mm, uh, yeah. because it, uh, it, it just, uh, I was thinking whether, I, I don't think it, it comes up as one of your three. Uh, approaches for a solution, and it's uh, oh. it's, it's probably a, a totally a mis, a totally wrong-headed idea. But I was wondering mm. whether uh, another possible solution could be pursued by uh, doing uh, some sort of restricted quantification, similar to what you did for the for the first problem. So the idea would be mm. to, I mean, when you have the uh, grounding principle, abstraction principle. Uh, you, you basically you quantify over all pluralities, A's and B's mm -hmm. that don't include their number. So, yeah. so, you, so you restrict to pluralities that don't include uh, their own number. I see. Uh, and then you put uh, there are equinumerous, the there are equinumerous grounds, the fact that the number of one is identical with the number of the other. I mean, it's, it just... <laughs> yeah, so let's go back to where I have those uh, laws formulating, so I've formulated. So say here, um, uh, so I take it the, you would yeah. restrict here and say that for, uh, so first for uh, pluralities x, x, and y, y that do not involve numbers. With well, their own numbers, then I don't know. Oh, oh yeah, they, right. Their own number. So, um, I see. Because, but yeah. Otherwise, I mean, there would be too strong a restriction if you put every number because then you don't, I don't think you're gonna get uh, the bootstrapping. Yeah, um, we want the bootstrapping, yeah, okay, good. But, so, but the uh, idea was just to restrict to those that don't include their own number. Yeah, so uh, you in effect say that if assuming that plurality, that number is not one of x, x yeah, yeah, then yeah. we go on. Yeah, very good. Um, yeah, that was the idea, I don't know. If... Mm, mm. Um, yeah. 
it might it might work yeah it might get you off the hook i need to uh, to carefully work through the details and see but it might well get you off the hook um um although i kind of i kind of like the idea that any pair say would uh, would be capable of uh, or grounding the existence of, of two. Uh, uh, so to have a totally general link between uh, the existence of a pair and, and the cardinal number two, say, uh, that generality is nice and that's lost here. So now you say that, uh, uh, so if this is indeed a pair plurality, then for any pair, assuming two is not a member of that pair, then the existence of that pair would ground the cardinal number two. Uh, it's now I see nothing immediately wrong about it, so it's not a not a bad idea at all. And I will have to to think carefully about it. So uh, thank you for that. And and my worry, just off the cuff, is that it will uh, be less general. That it would be really good to to have something systematic to say about the. Uh, relation between uh, uh, the right hand side of an abstraction principle and the left hand side. Yeah, I mean, you, uh, you say, ah, uh, unless this a bad case arises, then the relation is so and so. Oh. Yeah, no, I mean, you, you can oh. still have the biconditional as unrestricted, it's just mm -hmm. when you have the sufficiency conditional, you're going to put the, yeah. the restriction. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, it's 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 a very neat idea, and um, uh, yeah, we need to look carefully at whether yeah, this yeah, is yeah. sufficient to, <laughs> to 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 get you out of all kinds of of trouble. Um, Yeah, I'll, I'll think about it and, 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 and get back to you. Um, Thank you. Let no. me know. Yeah. No. Okay, so another question from Julia Lausland. Yes. Um, hi, Esther. Um, so I was just wondering um, whether you could talk a bit more about the solution you had to the bad company problem. So mm -hmm. I just. Maybe like, uh, is it supposed uh, to be like the, how does it map onto this like predicative, impredicativity oh, yeah. solution? Yeah. So is it the idea somehow that the good principles are uh, predicative and the uh, bad ones are impredicative or how, or is it not really yeah. mapping onto it mm -hmm. in that way? Yeah, so in the book, I, I, I tie this to, to uh, uh, predicative versus impredicative abstraction quite a lot, uh, where the, um, the relevant notion of predicativity or not is when you look at, let me write it up here. You look at the abstraction and then the quantification involved on the right-hand side. So do you here quantify over the objects that figure on the left-hand side? Mm -hmm. um, and in the book, the, uh, the uh, uh, line is that, look, it's definitely safe to uh, proceed in, uh, in a predicated manner. So if you ensure that on the right-hand side, you only ever quantify over domains that do not include the objects that you're seeking to introduce, then it's predicated and then it's okay for that reason. So here uh, we ease up a bit since um, as came up in the example of, of auto abstraction, for instance, uh, you are quantifying over, uh, so say we have uh, the numbers up to and including two uh, and you're quantifying over uh, all pluralities involving objects you've got, including uh, Two numbered pull out it, and you can get two. So yeah. we're easing up a little bit here uh, compared to the book, but the spirit is still the same. And the spirit is is very much that of uh, 
of having uh, the uh, uh, having the old uh, domain, so what you have already accounted for, and then use that and only that to account for some more. Mm. So, um, so in a looser sense, it's still predicative, but uh, not in quite as, as strict a sense as in the book. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and you, in fact, maybe that should be seen as, as an advantage of the uh, uh, bringing to bear the, uh, the uh, what I'm calling the grounding machinery here too, uh, since this now gives you a way of enforcing this uh, guiding idea that uh, go ahead and abstract by all means, it's all fine, it's all permissible, so long as the new objects that you seek to introduce will have all of their properties grounded in the old objects that you have already accounted for. Uh, yeah, no, I guess I, I, yeah. it seems to be a, a nicer, uh, gen, more general uh, yeah. uh, picture than just restrict, restricting it a bit superficially to predictivity. Yeah, yeah. That's, I think that's right. And, um, it's a more of, it's a more robust philosophical idea while enforcing the, uh, uh, predicativity requirement as it, it arises here is uh, it's a bit more clunky and it forces me to uh, to proceed in um, in two steps in a way I don't in didn't in the talk today so in the book I I look at a two sorted language so you have one sort for the old objects and a new sort for the new objects. So you first do it in that way and ensure predicativity in that way. And then you merge the source. So you kind of bring the old, the, the old and the new together again in a separate move. Mm -hmm. So with the, uh, the way of doing it that I, I talked about today, you avoid having to uh, uh, split things into those two separate steps. Yeah. I think that's an, an advance, you know. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, actually we already run out of time, but I myself have a question, so <laughs> sorry, let it be the last one. Yeah. So Einstein, uh, the equinumerosity of Obama with himself grounds the existence oh. of one, the cardinal number. Yeah. And then uh, the equinumerosity of one with itself grounds the existence of one, the cardinal number. Mm -hmm. We, so to say, Abstracted two times, right? Yeah. That is, we used Obama on the left hand side of a symmetric abstraction principle and got the existence of one. Uh, then we used one on the left hand side of the abstraction principle and got the existence of one. Mm -hmm. So are these ones the cardinal numbers and let's say the facts of the existence um, mm, different or these are the same? You drew them separately on your diagram, which you show now. Mm -hmm. uh, does it presuppose that these are not the same objects and res respective facts? How do you propose to show that these are the same? Shouldn't the abstraction principles kind of produce new entities and ground the existence of these new entities? Why does abstraction of equinumerous equinumerosities of different mm -hmm. objects give rise to and ground the same new objects or in grounding terms one set of elementary particles arranged arrange table wise gives rise to a table and another set of elementary particles give rise to another table but why yeah. it at least intuitively doesn't fall for <laughs> uh, yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. i see oh nice yeah yeah. Okay, so in the case of, of the table, yeah, then you have the material uh, organized in a certain way here, material organized in a certain way there, that grounds table one, that grounds table two, and these are distinct. So when you have uh, 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 cardinal numbers, that's not the picture. So here you can have uh, AA and BB, two, uh, two-membered uh, pluralities, uh, double-term pluralities, uh, 
And here the claim is that they both ground the existence of, uh, of one and the same object, namely cardinal number two. Um, yeah, uh, that's, that's just how cardinality abstraction works, that the, uh, the equivalence relation that you abstract on is quite uh, coarse-grained. So that here the equivalence is, is uh, uh, being such that you can put in one-to-one -one correspondence as you do here. Um, and that really relates very different pluralities uh, come out to be equivalent. So when you operate with very coarse-grained equivalences, then you get objects that are more mathematical in character. Typically they will be abstract, right? Since uh, spatial temporal location will not be shared by all the uh, uh, specifications that you have here that are equivalent. And then when you look more over in the concrete territory, uh, then the equivalence relation uh, that you operate with is uh, much more demanding. So uh, some particles here uh, arranged table-wise and some over here arranged table-wise, they will not be equivalent. So uh, for that reason, you get distinct tables uh, since you don't identify uh, the tables. Does that help? So it's, 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 it's the nature of the equivalence relations that you, uh, uh, you operate with. So it's just coerciveness of abstraction principle or identity relation. Right? So I didn't hear that uh, entirely. Can you say that again? So what really matters is coerciveness of uh, the identity relation. Yes. Yeah, you look at the criterion of identity and the equivalence relation uh, that figures in the criteria of identity, and then it's all a matter of how how coarse grained is uh, is that uh, equivalence. And also another uh, really uh, important distinction is um, uh, when you look at an instance of the relevant equivalence claim, uh, alpha is equivalent to beta. Will that be um, uh, a fact that's somehow intrinsic to alpha and beta? Or will you need to look beyond alpha and beta to find out whether they're equivalent or not? So uh, take concrete objects where uh, uh, the equivalence uh, that I say figures in, in cases of uh, grounding the existence of physical bodies is spatial temporal continuity. So you have some matter and some other matter. Take my, my pen here. Uh, why is this physical body identical with that physical body? Well, the two are connected spatial temporally. So that is an equivalent statement, alpha uh, equivalent beta. Uh, the obtaining of which involves facts beyond alpha and beta. Namely, are they connected through a continuous uh, uh, stretch of, of physical material? But when you look uh, at uh, uh, something like, uh, uh, is this pair uh, equinumerous with that pair? You only need to look at those two pairs. So that is a big difference too. Uh, so uh, uh, when the equivalence relation is uh, intrinsic to alpha and beta, then all the information about the uh, resulting abstract objects will be implicit in alpha and beta, uh, which gives you a kind of a priori like access to uh, information about the resulting abstract objects since to find information about uh, the abstract of alpha, abstract of beta, that reduces to statements about alpha and beta and statements of, and the equivalent statement uh, about alpha and beta is solely about alpha and beta in that case. Okay, thank I hope you. That helps. Yeah. yeah.